Sorry, I had mute on there on myself. Hello and welcome to our game. It's myself, Shane Stapleton. On the far side there is Michael Verney. And delighted to say we're, uh, we're joined by XGA president, Liam O'Neill. Uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. If you want that uh, leash jersey that Michael Verney is wearing, and, and Liam is quite impressed by or maybe this Kildare one or any of the other ones, go to orgoretro.com and use the promo code our game for 15%. Off. Liam, delighted to have you on. Um, big week for Leash. Obviously, Port Arlington are going to be out in the club football semi final at Croke Park. But Clock Bell Akala, I mean, for a parish, 300 people, give or take, or is it 300 club members? I mean, this is huge. I mean, you're from a small town in Leash yourself, Trummer. It, it's obviously huge. Yeah, it is huge. It's um, I was surprised by the number actually, the members they said because it will be it will be a, a much smaller community than that would suggest. That would mean that every house would have a member almost you know so that's kind of unusual but it shows you that this is not an ordinary community um you know um, people might be surprised that they're in the Leinster final those of us who've been watching them over the years from a hurling point of view would know that that's not a surprise um they're a very sophisticated smart outfit um they have been coming for probably 20 years uh doing performing consistently in leash for the last 10 12 years certainly and um they have a bright future ahead of them. They're planning for the future. They have two pitches, the two villages in their parish, only two villages now, small villages, the village of Balakala, which would have featured over the years in Tidy Town's national uh, winning enclosure. So they will have a history of of uh, good involvement. And then Cluck Village has become slightly bigger than Balakala now with the, with the change in housing in the country. And you, you were saying to me beforehand, there is a history of sophistication in this area. It's not... Uh... You know, there's nothing new with them being progressive. No, absolutely not. Ahabo Parish is, is a very famous historical parish. Uh, St. Canis of Ahabo, later of Kilkenny, of Kilkenny fame, um, had a monastery there. And one of his uh, his disciples, one of his monks, was a man called St. Fergal. And St. Fergal's Rathdowney is called after him. And Fergal is a patron of the, of the diocese. But he was called Virgilius. He moved to Strasbourg. And he was one of the first people to prove that the earth was round. So there was, there was a, a history of great learning in that place. And they are sophisticated people. And um, people often um, think, equate rural with backward. But I can assure you, this, the people of uh, Abo Parish are very rural, but they bring the best of it. Sophisticated, they're well-educated. And it's not surprising that they are where they are, really. Mm. Yeah, Michael, do you want to jump in there? I know in Burr, you still think the earth is flat. No, it's great to hear. Um, we've three rural people or three rurally uh, born people on the show here today. So it's great to see uh, the rural population being, uh, being stood up for. But uh, I, I would definitely agree with what Liam says there about clock. We've played them for you know the last 10 or 15 years, as long as I've been involved with Burr. Always had serious talent. I remember even, uh, I remember the year uh, Owlert went on to win the Leinster title. They scraped over clock Balakala in Port Leash. Um, and there was a poor decision, I remember, because I remember Kevin Martin was over them at the time. And there was a poor decision during the game that kind of cost them or a decision that wasn't made. So they've always been close. They've always had, um, you know, herders that, you know, a good handful of herders that we'd all know nationally. Um, and they've a, a decent spread on the, the leash squad at the moment and a decent spread of former players as well. And just something I was saying to you beforehand, like Willie Highland retired from leash to guts of about five years ago, age 28 with a you know a bad enough knee injury that just would not take county training he never played in crow park for leash and now five years later he gets to play in crow park for his club uh, and that's just the magic of what uh, what club hurling can give you and give some lads a new lease of life as well and just tone down the training a small bit and focus on quality a bit more than quantity but uh, they've got loads of quality and they'll be happy with how they're going into this game at the weekend they got their the leinster you know the game in leinster that monkey off their back they were brilliant the last day. They're, you know, massive underdogs again going in. Um, everything looks to be in Ballyhale's favour. The experience, Crow Park, um, but that'll only fuel uh, the clock ballot call lads even more. Mm. Liam, do you, do you give clock a chance going into this game? Everyone would look at Ballyhale and say they haven't lost the Leinster final since 1991. They've won their last six finals that they've competed in. You know, they are the aristocrats of Leinster Club Hurling. They are the aristocrats, and it would be foolish for anyone to say that they wouldn't fear uh, playing them. They are a very, they're a great team, probably one of the greatest uh, club sides um, ever. So, yes, it's it's a big challenge. But you have to remember, again, Cluck Balakala, and they were called Balakala at one stage. They were called Ballygehan, which is a townsland in the middle of the parish. Um, but the club, Balakala, 
Cluck, Balakala, Ballygehan, actually won the All Ireland as a club side in 1915. And um, in Cork, they beat a crowd called Reddendite, who nearly went out of business last year. And, um, you know, Ballygehan in, were caught in Canises at one stage as well. They're still going. So they have a long history, they have a proud history, and they'd like the idea of being back in Croke Park. Mm. And do you, do you fall in line with this opinion that Croke Park suits um, Ballyhale because of all these county players they have and that it's one, like Clock obviously had the benefit of playing their last few games in Port Leash. You know, I've played there. It's a great place, but certainly Croke Park, by you know, there's a huge difference. You go in there, it's just this huge chasm. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I was fortunate enough to play in the old Croke Park myself once in a in a third level game. Um, it's 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 the place everyone wants to play. But when you mentioned Willie Highland uh, didn't play there for Leash, Leash went through a period of thirteen years where we didn't get a game in Croke Park. You know that was awful. But Willie paid for the Irish Shinty team, so there would have been a connection. So there would always have been people in that club that would have been of a standard that would deserve to play in Croke Park. But that's the awful. Kind of difficulty. There's um, there's an underworld even in the top echelons of hurling. We've been in the top um, division one of hurling almost all my lifetime, uh, apart from a few times where we dipped to division two back straight away. But there's a big chasm between those who are at the bottom of the top tier and those who are at the top, and th- we don't always get the recognition that's deserved in the sense that we always had good hurlers in leash. We just didn't have enough of them. And part of that is because. Our parishes are small. You know, if you can compare, uh, Clock Balacolla would be going out on, on Sunday from a parish of probably 300 houses. Let's say that's what it is. That's only a couple of housing states in the big place. Ballygunner are in the same competition. Ballygunner have more people in their parish than we have in the entire hurling area in Leash. That puts the, 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 the thing in context for you. I know there are other small clubs and people trade on that. Almost all clubs call themselves small. But I can tell you that... When you come to Leash, we have clubs from very small areas. My own club is from a townsend of 50 houses. That's it. We're a bit like Leach and we do have people come back to us, you know, in that sense. But that's how small it is. And putting us, amalgamating us with another club wouldn't add, wouldn't still add up to a population that would be a, a threat on the, on the national scale. So, you know, we, we clubs come together. By the way, people think... Cluck Balacolla is an amalgamation. It's the same parish. It's just called the Cluck Balacolla thing only rec- came about 30 years ago to give recognition to the fact that there were two villages in the parish. But that's still one parish. You know, we have uh, right down the arrow, one parish again, but where, that was two senior teams. Boris Gilcotton was two. The Harps was uh, made up of three teams at one stage. But uh, Cluck Balacolla is a single club unit and always has been. Hmm. Do, you, do you look at this and see this is another part of Leash trying to work their back... Uh, way back up to the top. I know you mentioned that they normally are in Division One of the league, but you know there's been no winner since 1997. Camras and before that they won it in or, sorry 96. Before that 76. Castletown got to the final in 2001. Um, so obviously no team had gotten to the final for a long time. And the Leash hurling team took a a massive dip there around 10 years ago. I think we all remember the day that Cork scored 10 goals against them. But you know obviously back up to the top tier again. Won the relegation playoff last year. Like, is this another important step for Leash Hurling as a whole and how it holds itself? It's another little window for people to look into Leash Hurling and say that it's not as bad as all that sounds. Um, uh, you know, yes, we did take a dip. We we competed with the best in the 80s. We were unfortunate to run into an awfully team that was on the way up. Castletown, I think they were in three finals against Burr. They were unfortunate to run into what was the best team in the country by a mile at that stage as well. And But for a bit of indiscipline, or maybe a lot of them this one, uh, Castellan would have beaten Burr. I think Michael might even recognise that. You know, that's that's recognised by Burr people. Uh, so they, were, they, were, they weren't as far away from it. The difficulty is that, yeah, we ran out of steam. Uh, Cork beat us badly that day. That was really unfortunate. But you have to remember, and I like remembering uh, or reminding Cork people, no county has a better record than Leash in our Ireland fight against Cork than Leash has. Only, only other, uh, and we beat them, we played them one, beat, clear now have beaten them since in 1913 in probably one of the greatest two finals ever, but that was a draw and a win. So, you know, we're we're not, Leash isn't 
as low on the totem pole as people think. It's just unfortunate that we haven't, at times, we just haven't got what it, what it took to get to a, to a stage. In the early 80s, you had two Kilkenny men in charge of Leach and Offaly. You had Dermot Healy in, the, uh, in charge of Offaly and the great George Lahey. But for a goal through a side netting in 1981, Offaly were beaten by Leash. Now, I'm not whinging about that. That happens. Offaly pushed on and won the All-Ireland this year. And I've often admitted, I don't think we would have. But there was something about Offaly at that stage. They'd won in football. They knew, they knew how to win. And I think knowing how to win is a huge uh, factor in less successful groupings, not making, not getting the rewards they deserve. We don't know how to win in Leash at that level yet. But, you know, if you look at those who look at Fitzgibbon uh, Cup teams over the last 10, 15 years, there are far more Leash hurlers now featuring on third level teams and there are far more and the competition was never as great as it was back in my time uh, there was very it was very easy to get on a Fitzgibbon team now you have to be a serious hurler to do it but there are more and more leash hurlers featuring and that's 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 good and we have had I suppose the um, the spark that Cheddar brought to leash hurling certainly um, I mean again we almost had Galway beaten twice in Port Leisure in the Leinster oh. Championship. You know, very unfortunate. But it's to get that little step from where we are now. And Club Balacala will have to overcome that on Sunday. That little worry is in the back of the mind all the time. Will something happen to, 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 to make us implode again? But you know what? They're there or thereabouts. They're confident. They're not overconfident. They, are, they know they're good. And they're just hoping to get the extra step. And they have, they have surprised some people outside the leash. But they're better than Clock Balacana are better than Leash's rating would be at the moment. I think people recognise that. It, that wasn't a sort of a that wasn't a kind of a a blustering performance last week. That was a sophisticated performance um, in a sense that Chemical Croaks had time to come back at them two or three times, but they pushed on every time and got the extra tackle in. But they also put their put their bodies on the line. Every single one of those players put their bodies on the line last week. I hope that the effort of getting here won't tell against them on Sunday. That's the only thing I think might. Mm. Yeah, because M- Michael, you obviously, I'm sure you've seen the game back at this stage. You, you were covering another game. But the thing that stood out to me was the quality of the touch and the stick work of these Leash players. And I've always said it, Leash never lack hurling. It's just maybe some of the other things, the numbers, maybe the athleticism, that's something that can obviously be developed over time. Some counties took a... Uh, you know, burst on with that and others didn't. But you saw Rhinos against Ballyhale last week and Rhinos, you know, they left it behind him. It was a, a goal at the at the last gas that allowed it to go to extra time and Ballyhale won. How are you looking at this game now? Where can, you know, where can Clock get at Ballyhale even? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Uh, you have Clock coming in uh, who are seriously in form, as I said, have that monkey off their back. Uh, you have Ballyhale coming in who were, you know, not particularly impressive against against Mount Leinster Rangers, and they were impressive for the first fifteen minutes against Rhinos, and you'd probably say for the last fifteen or twenty. In between, they were yeah under pressure, under big pressure at different stages, and they really, really got out of jail. Um, now I don't know if that's papering over some cracks. Potentially, it could be like going into the game at the weekend. There's doubts over Colin Fenley with a kind of a shoulder arm injury. There's doubts over Evan Shefflin, a leg injury, looked like a dead leg. Uh, haven't heard anything about uh, Joey Cuddy, his availability yet, and we probably won't hear about that if they have appealed until tomorrow night or Saturday. There's three big players just going down through it. I think Joey Cuddy has hit the guts of about 214 from play in this year's championship. Evan Shefflin has hit seven points from play from wing back, and Colin Fenley has hit three four. You know, if they're missing one or two of those lads. Um, that definitely opens the door a bit more for Clock Balacala. I do think, I, I don't know if Bally Hale are the force that they were. The, the, the consistency within their performances at the moment would suggest that they're definitely on the wane in this championship or maybe they've been on the road a while. But they're still getting the job done. But I definitely think uh, Clock Balacala will see openings there. Um, and just going down through it, I think Owen Cody is hit something like 320 from play uh, in this year's championship from the Kilkenny from the preliminary round to this stage of the Leinster Championship, 
like if they can shut someone like him down, he's like really doing an awful lot of damage. And he was the one that got them over the line the last day with, with two, three, and particularly with that goal at the end of normal time. I'd say they'd probably go after him in particular and put one of their best man markers on him. TJ hasn't been maybe having the influence that he would normally have. So like there's there's lots of optimism um within within Clock Balakala and they're on a bit of a crest of a wave. So I think they'll focus a nice bit on, on Ballyhill but I think they'll try to continue to do what they've been doing really well so far. That's getting in teams' faces, um, over on them physically, over on them with the work rate. Like the last day, uh, Kilma could Crokes didn't know what had hit them. Um, even in the last minute, they still didn't know what had hit them with the intensity that was, you know, in their faces. So they're gonna have they're gonna try and bring that uh, again uh, to Crow Park. But as I said to you last day, their last four games have been in Moore Park. This is, you know, this game is going to be in Crow Park. Conditions are going to be perfect. There won't be uh, the ball will not be slowing down in conditions or anything. Maybe like it was in, like it was in Omore Park. But there's definitely a lot of openings there for them, without a doubt. Yeah, Patrick Hickey comments in watching from Croom after surgery. Thanks, Mike, for nice messages the other day. Data six says Rhino's man here still absolutely sickened after Sunday. I feel like if Rhino's won, they would have went on and beat Clock Balakala absolutely sickened. And Elizabeth Howard, former GA, uh, Camogie president, I should say. Great to see Lee man with you guys. He was a great president and never saw the limelight. Great club man now at Trumra. Us rural people can hold our own in any company. And so say all of us. Actually, Liam, can I ask you about, you know, your, your presidency of the GA? You were the 37th president. Um, I'm, I was involved in plen plenty of the press gatherings when you when you were speaking and that. What was your, your route to it? I, I saw an interview after you stepped down and you, you were saying it was eight years of age when the first idea crossed your mind about being GEA president. Yeah, someone asked you about that. Um, I My birth coincided with kind of uh, free TV, TV coming in. I was born in 1955, so you can work out what age I am now. And most people know that, so I don't mind saying it. I was a young fellow when TV came to Ireland and the first All-Ireland final I saw uh, was the... Um, the, the hurling final in 63 at uh, Watford and um, and Kilkenny. And what I'd been, my first game in Crow Park was that year. I watched Watford. But I used to bang the ball off the back wall like all of us did, as sure, when we were children. A big back wall with a single sort of a window over a landing, which I broke almost weekly. Um, and there were small windows, and uh, we all knew how to patch windows in those days. But I was banging the ball off the wall, and I noticed that the uh, in watching those matches as a child, there were two important people there at the end of the game, and everyone wants to be in the centre of things when you're a child. So there was the captain of the team and the president. And I remember I, wore, I said to Dad, I'd love to be a captain. It would be great to get the, the cup. And I was a bright enough child. It didn't, it didn't be too bright to work this out as a leash person at the time. The chances, we hadn't got a club. So the chances of me being a leash captain were very slight. And number two, chances of leash winning it. So I worked out I was never going to be in that picture as a captain. And I said to my dad one day, the other, what's the other job? And he says, president. He said, I'd like to be there. So as a child, it's funny. Now, I didn't think of that for a long, long time, but it's funny. Uh, and the point of that story to me is that if you have the mind of a child at seven or eight, you have that child for life, you know, and that's what the GA used to do and still does, I hope, to the same extent. We're now capturing people younger because we're taking care of them in nurseries. But if you have a child from early on, you have him or her for life. And that's why it's really important that we include young people. And young people from both parishes will be there in numbers in Croke Park. And that's where the dreams, I'm sure you had them too. We all had them. The dream was to be the person who does the good thing for the community and gets the recognition. Yeah. So my route was very simple. I, um, I was involved. My first job was secretary of UCD. Uh, Hurling Club when I was a teenager, I didn't know an awful lot about it, but someone said we need a secretary, and I said, sure, I can do that. I became chairman of it then, moved across the paths to do the primary degree afterwards, would have uh, been involved in coming a month ago in Dublin for four years as a teacher there. When I came back then, I entered Leash Juvenile Competitions. I would have founded coming a month ago in Leash with some colleagues of mine, um, got great support on that, and I would have worked my way up through Leash to become secretary. Um, at a time when Leash were at a great low, really, in around 2000. And uh, I was never I was never elected because I was either charismatic or popular. I was elected because we were needed somebody to do the job that had to be done. And I did that. Um, the fact that that job went well for me and, you know, we rebuilt Moore Park stand at a time. And 
that that gave me the profile to be a Leinster chairperson. And then you're in the frame for that, you know. But I would regard myself as very fortunate to become president of the GA. Leash people don't get those jobs easily. They fall easier for the bigger counties. And the majority of the presidents, just fact, are from Kilkenny to Brary Cork and the bigger counties. So it was a bit of a thrill. We only had one other person, president of the GA, who was um, representing Leash, but he was a Kilkenny man called Bob O'Keefe, who lived in Boris and Austria and played actually on the Ballygehan team in 1915. So an interesting connection. So that was the route. Um, you get one shot at it. If you happen to be and great people um, lost out in races for presidency because there were other candidates, unfortunately, at the, around at the same time. I mean, nobody would have beaten Joe McDonough for president. Absolutely. You know, there are some people who are just outstanding people and it would have been very hard to beat them. I was fortunate the way it happened. I was also fortunate, I suppose, I'm not good at elections. I don't like asking for votes. Um, but there was a sorting out process before the um, the April where the election was and the others dropped out. And I was the, f the first president, apart from Davin, I think, to be elected unopposed. So I was fortunate in that sense. I doubt, to be honest, Shane, you get one run at these things and I would count myself very fortunate if it was all to happen again, I might not have been president of the GA, but I really enjoyed the, the few years. I did my best. You're not as well prepared for it as people think. A lot of it is left to chance. And I'd love in the future if uh, we actually had some sort of a sorting out process where people would be better prepared for being president of the GA. I would like to be better prepared. Looking back now with, with hindsight, you, you do your challenge? best. You hope. You were present at a good few of them. Um, the press conferences were absolutely horrendous at times. The amount of stuff fired at you and people would pick you up and some minor thing you said, you know, and then the awful thing was um, you do your best and you try to answer questions honestly, but somebody maybe on social media picks up on something, um, I don't know, uh, something small and makes a big deal out of it. And you have no, you have no real way of engaging in that conversation because it's, it's it's out there. So someone takes a, a dim view of what you said or how you look. And I was often criticised because I didn't smile enough. Um, you know, I, would, um, I was often amused at that because, you know, but people like to see a smile in the parent and I didn't do enough of it. Uh, so that was often criticised for that. But uh, there are things you're criticised. Some of it is unfair. Now, the other side of that is, is to be honest, you get away with some things that you shouldn't have got away with too you know you maybe made bad decisions or whatever but uh, i'd be big enough to say yeah there are things i'd like to have done better but you know what you get one, you get one shot at it i think most people are fair to accept that you're doing your best and they respect that and you try to do your best because it's for three years it is the organization that we all care about more than any other organization in the world and you try to do your best for it what was the thrill like then in, uh, I think 2012 was your first year and the hurling final went to a replay. So I presume given Michael Murphy handing him the Sam Maguire was the first time you kind of lived this dream of presenting the cup or being involved in that, that yeah. moment. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was, moment. It was, it was a kind of a, a difficult moment for me because the hurling final replay wasn't until after the football that year. And unfortunately, um, one of my sisters died the day before that Ireland final. So I was in an awkward position. It was a tough day. I was delighted to give it to Murphy. I think he's a brilliant I often said he was a, a, a superb young man, a real really great footballer, but a person of huge character. And I was delighted that he was the first person I gave it to. Yeah, it's a huge honour, of course it is. But the difficulty about the cup is that, given the cup, and I was criticised that day for not smiling, but the guy who who um, who'd criticised me didn't realise the circumstances. But what happens when you present the cup, Shane, is that you're given this this enormous cup, it's almost impossible to lift it. Um, and, you know, captains are stronger than presidents. So you're given this cup and it's really very, very heavy. So now you have to hold it in one hand and shake the hand of the captain with the other hand. And you shake with your right hand. So you're holding this enormously heavy cup with your left hand and the strain is terrible. And people don't realize because it's weighing down, it's weighing down your hand and you don't want to drop it because Buffy's bet on whether the president will drop the cup or not, and I was twelve to one to, to drop it. Um, so that was that was on my mind as well. So you're given this cup then, and you give it to the captain. You congratulate him. You hand it to him, and do you know what you do then? You just say like that. Thank God. So 
unfortunately, then what happens is the lads go zap, zap, zap with the cameras and you're caught maybe with an unsmiling face. And you're <laughs> delighted. You're delighted. But unfortunately, in that moment, and I was in that, that day, I was caught in a pose where I wasn't smiling. And people said, what's wrong with him? <laughs> well, did you go into training, Liam, um, for, for holding the trophy? Did you have to go into I training or a few bicep I curls or anything like that? No, no, but I'll tell you what, if I hadn't again, I would. I would have. Yeah, but that's a very smart news. But that's that's what goes on in, in that particular moment, you know. And um, you think it's important what you say. And I kept my speeches to five sentences because I knew that nobody wanted to hear, nobody ever wants to hear anything the president says unless he makes a mistake. And everyone everyone will listen to, to that. So your biggest thing is get your five things said. Congratulate the thank everyone for coming. Congratulate the winners. Commiserate with the losers. Thank the sponsors. Congratulate the county win and hand over the cup. That was my that was my formula. Get it over as quickly as possible. Michael, do you want to ask anything? Yeah, just a quick one, Liam. Um, going back through your reign and you obviously accomplished an awful lot during it. Is there anything? Um, have you any regrets looking back, or do you often think back? Oh, I would have loved to have accomplished this. You can't accomplish everything, obviously, during a reign. But is there anything maybe that you think might have slipped away, or something that you would love to have completed? Yeah, my biggest regret was I tried. I tried, and people said I was foolish to even try it. I tried to bring the Camogie Ladies Football and the GA together, and unfortunately, I failed. Ladies football said a blank no. Camogie was more amenable. I regret now that I didn't go ahead with Camogie and Hurling. And you like those because it just slipped away from us. You know, I didn't expect it. I thought when we made the offer that they would accept it as in good faith and that we wanted to do the best for... I come from a family. I was reared with seven girls, six, you know, six, three above me, three below me. And they got no, they got no look in. And I thought, God, I'd love to do something for the, my nieces... Uh, and my own grandchildren, that we could change the attitude and maybe support them. But people viewed it with suspicion, unfortunately, in ladies' football and thought we wanted to take them over. God, we had enough to do to run what we were going to do. We would have, we would have envisaged a federal system. Porik was prepared to step down as CEO and have a super CEO, which would over, oversee the three organisations. We made that offer to ladies' football now, and it was just rejected. And it was an awful, I think it's an awful pity. And look what's happened in the meantime with the FAI, with the soccer women's soccer team. What's happening right now with the ladies, with the ladies playing and the women playing rugby, and we had a chance to be way ahead of that, but we didn't do it. And I suppose I regret that if I had it again, I would have tried it differently. But I really wasn't expecting the rejection, and it kind of imploded on me a bit, and it's a huge regret, absolutely, because we could be so much further on. Um, Camogie has come on dramatically in the last number of years um, and I do some work with them, I didn't work on the year, year before with them uh, Ladies Football is in a really strong place but if we had United Organisation we could attract so much more funding we could attract so much more advertising um, revenue TV interest You know, at the moment now the GA through Peter McKenna is working with Camogie on sponsorship uh, which is great because that that's badly needed. Komogi needs that. But what I've always said, what happens to Komogi will happen to Hurling. And if we don't develop Komogi, if we, and if we don't look after the entire family, the modern family expects the entire family to be looked after. We do that reasonably well. But if we could say we had one organisation, one membership, where a, a, a young girl uh, would be treated equally and valued for what she is in the same way as boys are, that would be brilliant. The sad the sadness in my three years was people didn't actually get what I meant by that and I didn't manage to do it and it'll always be a huge regret until we are a united organisation that will continue to be a regret of mine. Mm. Is there anything you're particularly proud of from the three years something that you got through? I'm happy happy that we got the uh, football review we didn't manage to get the championship structures out of the Eugene McGee led committee but we got a, a review of Gaelic football and it was badly needed it's still badly needed actually um I was happy with that success I got happy that we reviewed hurling to under Liam Sheedy not significant changes were made there too we increased the number of people playing in Fela that was always a bugbear in mind that only the elite clubs got to go to Fela now we've broadened it out that we have a number of different competitions. So clubs that never got to travel, got to travel. Unfortunately, the world has overtaken Phil now and going away with teams is not in the modern world where 
uh, people are, are worried about safety it's not as easily done as it was years ago. Um, but it has been broadened out. There are far more people it's moved to 15 to, to include more people and to to get more clubs out of their counties playing other things. I'm really proud of that, delighted with that. There are lots, lots of other small things that don't add up to much in review, but the whole, the whole stage is you're trying to, we did a lot on club development too and on training club officers behind the scenes and, and financial management. All those sorts of things are routine stuff. Um, and people often criticise both Parik and myself over the television deals. But last year, despite the fact that RT gave out murder about our TV deal, the GA Go was a huge success at home. We never envisaged that. Now, we thought it was around the world it would be huge, huge. But last year, when we needed coverage of multiple games, the GA Go model that was part of that um, television deal in 2014 or 2013, as it was, uh, really came home to be a benefit for the organization despite the fact that we got huge criticism at the time but i think the criticism over sky involvement has kind of dissipated now people recognize that in the circumstances at the time where it looked like there was going to be a monopoly because tv3 were not going well at the time that the expansion of it i think has benefited uh, and we held our nerve on that we took the hit on it i got awful personal criticism over it you know we were scrutinized by the doyle committee on it we explained ourselves well there. Uh, we also went back talking about the overseas GA and explained to them how much it meant for people overseas to be able to access our games through Sky and through GA Go. And I quoted, I, I still think one of the nicest things I ever heard said was that a nurse in Bahrain at the Middle East Games, she was from Riyadh. And uh, before this was before we negotiated the deal. And she said, Liam, having the games on television and having having access to the games would be like a band-aid on a homesick heart. I thought that was a lovely expression. That's what the games meant to those overseas who hadn't the access we had. And we held that in our minds as we were negotiating that deal. So that was one that probably, it was a slow burner. It took a long time for people to recognise the value of it. And I know that some people still go on about it, but it was something that had to be done at the time. And we took a chance on it. We knew, we thought, sorry, we didn't know. We thought, as you think, what you do is the best thing to do. But we followed. We didn't back down on it. And we held our nerve and did what we thought was the best thing to do. And when you're, when you're watching from afar now, we've heard in the last year or so, um, I'm trying to remember, was it Tom Ryan who mentioned it, but the talk of like Amazon Prime, this sort of thing coming in maybe as a rights holder. Where do you see it going? I don't really uh, i'm not really as close to what's happening in in that space at the moment but i do know that we have to be open-minded i do know that's important i think the games on television and you have to remember that i think the the clear the time clear were coming well in the mid 90s could have been 95 96 not sure which was the first time that a provincial final was put on television you know so looking at the games broadcasting the number of games that that rt have been doing for the last 30 years was unheard of before I mean, in my time as a child, you saw the Ireland final, you saw Patrick's Day, and you saw the Wembley games. And that's all the games that were on television. There was never such a thing as a club match on. So when you look at how far it's come, I think we have to be really open to the fact that television isn't what it was um, even 10 years ago. The young adults in their 20s and lead teenagers are not watching events now on television. They're watching it on handheld devices. I think we really have to be... Um, open to as much change as possible and i think that you have to be brave both in rules and in administration but also in 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 um, tv deals to be brave enough to leave open the possibilities for the future that you don't tie yourself or paint yourself into a corner we don't know where um where where media is going now visual media is going um but i think we have to be open and yeah, what people want is what we have to give them because seeing the games on television makes a huge difference. And I think we're seeing that now as we broadcast more ladies' games on television. The interest has increased. And people said, you know, that could never take off. Of course it can take off. You need to see it. You need to see the games. And the fact that we have extra means of doing them means we can cover more women's games now and girls will get to see their, their heroines on screen. And that's their feeling about themselves their their feeling of well-being and worth absolutely michael do you want to jump in 
No, just uh, Liam, if you, Larry McCarty is obviously the, the current president, it, it, uh, would you, if you had one piece of advice to give him through, through, to help him through his reign, what, what would that be? Or what's something that maybe that, that you learned from during your time there? Larry, look, Larry is actually better positioned than most of us. For a start, he's older. Getting the president, he's probably one of the, one of the most senior people to get become president of the GA. He's also skilled in handling media, uh, which the rest of us I've admitted weren't. Um, so he has, he is very well, he's very well uh, qualified to do the job. Um, okay, he's geographically disadvantaged, but he's 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 overcoming that. But um, you know, he he had a history. He was one of the first people down in the PE college. He he knows a lot of people from that era who are in their sixties now and in position to help him out. He has plenty of advice. I wouldn't dare advise him. I think, you know, I wish him really well. It's a tough, it's a tough uh, job. Um, I know he's well able for it. Uh, I'd wish, I, I, all I would ever do is uh, ask of the president would be that he follows his own heart, follows his head and does what he thinks is best for the organization. And you know what, the rest of us, there are, I think there are seven ex-presidents. We will all support that because we all know that it's not easy to do you know he's doing a great job he will do a great job and the great thing about being in that position i don't think there's any other position in well maybe president of the country that's held the position i'm talking about held in in greater respect than the office of president of the g and i was bowled over at times, uh, with how people turned out and treated the fact that the president is coming from adam some of them, but the fact that the GA president will come to their village. And I often cite there's two cases, Ballygar and Galway, and um, uh, where on the 28th of December, 300 people gathered into a hall simply because the president of the GA was coming. They, know, they could have been at home celebrating. Um, Shan Ballymore in Cork, on a Monday night, went down to what was supposed to be a very small presentation, arrived at 25 past seven for a half seven appointment, and they said, you can't come in yet. You have to wait five minutes. I walked in to a hall in a small village in Cork, packed to the rafters because the president of the GA was coming. I was bowled over. Sometimes you might take the position flippantly or maybe joke. I'd often, shame to know that from interviewing me, I'd often be, be kind of lighthearted about things. But then you realise that actually, no, these people are turning out to see you in the position you hold. And the GA presidency, um, at times, it's awesome how much respect people have for it. And I hope that never changes because that's something that separates our organization from any other organization in the world. That they, they, we still value the fact that the leader of our organization matters to us because you don't get to become president of GA unless you're from the people anyway. And an, an interesting well, Larry thing is from that, and he's done a great job. And one thing from the media side of, of things when you're de dealing with the GA president, you know, before you go to the press conference and, you know, people in, uh, who are working in the office producing the paper, they know that it's going to be back page. They don't know yet what you're going to say, but it's actually the word of the GA president is held in such high esteem that that is going to be the news line for tomorrow. So that kind of feeds into that. Liam, something I wanted to ask you, and I, I'm pretty sure towards the end of your tenure, you were one of these, uh, you kind of said that you don't want to be jumping in and sort of uh, making grandiose opinions and trying to almost steal the limelight of whatever president followed you in the GA. So I, I know you wouldn't like to second guess whoever's there at the moment. But just for the, the lay person, when they look and say, why didn't the amalgamations happen? Why didn't, um, why isn't the football championship being changed? And why aren't the provinces kind of scrapped and all this kind of stuff? When, when the GA president is trying to change this or when a review committee is trying to make these massive changes, is, it a, is there an element of people want to hold on to the power that they have in a certain association or a certain provincial body or... What is the biggest challenge when you're trying to make a big change within the GA? People people often think that. They think that, you know, oh, Leinster Council want to do this. Leinster Council is changing every five years. You know, I was president of GA. I was supposed to want this, that or the other for headquarters. I was gone after three years. I was out the door. I knew that. And when you're out the door as president of the GA, you're gone. I think um, Pori Purcell, I think, or Paddy Downey actually said it. Uh, famous Irish Times journalist, um, that there's nothing as X as an ex-president. And I can vouch for that, absolutely, and that's the way it should be. So you, when you're in those positions, you're not looking to hold it for for the county board, for Leinster or for Croke Park, because you're not going to be there. Why? You know, and yet people don't understand that. Um, and when you're in Croke Park and you go down the country, um, people think you live there. 
you know, I live in Trumra. I lived, that's where I lived, apart from the nights I spent where I, I couldn't get home. But you're not there for the long haul. You're there for a period in time. You want to leave the organization in a better position than you found it, if possible, or at least as good. In a, you won't do it in every case. But So there's no real agenda, and there's no real agenda in Croke Park. People, when people talk about the office in Croke Park. I wouldn't recognize. I'm gone now six years, seven maybe. Um, I wouldn't recognize a lot of the staff there. There's been absolutely huge turnover in Croke Park. True natural sort of um, events and the fact that people left in the last 12 months with a package. So the people who are there are no longer the people who were there in my time. So Croke Park doesn't have an agenda. You know, Lee Mulvey's gone. Bright Duffy's gone. Tom Ryan's there four years now. So it's not that the central body wants to do anything. That's how people perceive it. But it's just the people who are there at a particular time. And I suppose if you're asking me why don't things happen, why doesn't change happen easily? Change happens slowly because that's the process of change. If there's any change noted, people's first reaction is, how will this affect me? That's that's the natural question. And will I be worse off as a result of it? So people are conservative. That's the way the world over. You have to paint the picture for people and that sometimes they have to see it in action before they accept that it was a good idea. You know, uh, I mean, the one time we took the sideline kicks from the ground. R recently enough, you know, and someone's thought, well, God, you couldn't allow them to take it out of their hands. And look how it transformed things. That that simple change made a huge difference. The idea of taking a free from the hand out of the fence instead of having to, someone else put it down for you and you go up and give it the big toe up the field. You know, the <laughs> sophistication that came in, but that went on. You, that's not that long ago. I remember that going on, you know, and the bigger a kick you give it up the field, the better. But now people are thinking the game out. So change comes about slowly because people, it's its the natural order of things. And we're a very, we're a people-led organization. Of course, you're going to have conservatism. But conservatism, while I've always said I prefer, to, if I was going to make a mistake, I'd prefer to make a mistake by doing something than by not doing it. Because I think that's, the right way to do things you take a chance if you don't countenance change you're ruling out the possibility of improvement because the only way you can improve is to change so that's a natural thing but people don't get that so the slam us for the slam us for changing stuff like we got in trouble over the black card say so the, when you change stuff uh people say oh my god why did they change that wasn't it grand sure it's fine you know um then when you don't change something people say oh my god they won't change anything you know, because that's it's 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 media driven, but it's also the media reflect, reflecting the views of people on the ground. People people are suspicious of change, and you know what? Sometimes we change reasonably reasonably okay. I would have preferred with some of the changes that we would have done them because it was the right thing to do, rather than because we were made to do them. You know, we should have gotten rid of the ban a lot sooner than we did. We should have got rid of Rule Forty Two a lot sooner than we did, but we did it. And that was just reflective of the way the country was, you know, and Ireland has changed dramatically in the last 25 years. I think the GA has done a reasonably good job now, and we haven't made too many bad decisions, really. You know, Central Council, people give out about it, but if you go in there to change something, you have to have your case well made out. You have to have thought out who's going to benefit from it, who's going to think they're going to be worse off by it. And you have to sort of think what's really what is really in the long-term interest of the organization. And if you're brave and if you're a good administrator, I think you'll think, you know what, if it's the right thing to do, let's at least try to do it. But people are conservative, Shen. That's, you know, that's not just a GA phenomenon. Do you see, like, with the, with the funding, I see there's a, a motion that's, you know, for a more equitable system in terms of, like, the funding devised by John Conlon and a number of his associates. And it's been supported by Roscommon, Mayo, I see Paul Bellew of Galway has been talking about it as well. Do you see, you know, obviously a huge amount of funding has gone to Dublin. They're looking at more of the funding being relative to the amount of club players that are there. Do you see that, that changing in time? Like, why wouldn't that change in terms of like the funding being, you know, per club member rather than, you know, just a, a much bigger figure going to the lead county? Because quite frankly, if money could solve our problems, we would have solved our problems long ago. Money does not solve your problems. And we made a mistake for a long time thinking, oh, let's employ people. Let's buy someone to do that job that's done voluntarily. That doesn't really work out. Do you know what? You're better off with volunteers. You're better off uh, having the, the notion that people are doing this for the good of the 
parish or the club or the county, whatever it is. Um, so funding isn't going to solve it. If, if you poured, if, if you poured millions into my club, we only have 50 houses. You know, money's not going to solve where we are. We can do the best we can for that population. Uh, Leitrim can do the best, Carlo can do the best they can for their populations, long for to an extent. There's, you can certainly equalise things a little bit, but money, throwing money at a problem never solves a problem change. That's that's the truth the world over. That's the populist thing to say. And people recreate that sort of the, the, the narrative when it suits them. I was on the Lancer Council when the notion of doing the, um, and I was on the management committee in Croke Park when the notion of helping Dublin, because Dublin hadn't won for a long, long time. People saying, oh my God, you're letting, you're neglecting the capital. You're a rural based organization. You think rurally, you don't think of Dublin and you're going to lose the biggest center of population. You won't have people going to the games. Uh, you won't have people looking at the games and television. You'd better look after Dublin. And you know what we did? We did. And then it took off. And they became successful. They might have come successful anyway, but they became more successful than people thought they should. And then the fact that we helped them out that time and built the structures, helped Dublin. Now, Dublin did a lot themselves, helped Dublin build their structures. That became a really bad thing then in some people's minds because we had created this monster of a team that had won so many All-Irelands. Now people are saying, oh, let's take the money from Dublin, give it to counties. A certain amount of that might, but throwing money at counties that are not going to win the All-Ireland every year anyway. You know, um, for men have never won. Um, I don't think they've even won a, a, a provincial title. Um, Antrim, low enough on the, on the ratings as well. You know, so there are certain counties just haven't done it yet. We don't have won a provincial title either. doesn't say the organisation is, isn't good, but there's more can be done to help them, but throwing money at it is not the solution. That's populism. And unfortunately, the way the world's gone, the more populist statements you make the more notices you get in social media but it's not well thought out and uh, the, some of the stuff is not well thought out yes certainly there needs to be money put in places where it hasn't been up to now but i think that will happen but just saying that you can equalize it doesn't work really you know you can't you couldn't possibly justify putting the same money into leash and i don't mind using my own county as an example in case i offend anybody by mentioning their counties but you couldn't you could put the same amount into leash as you would into dublin and think that would equalize things it wouldn't quite frankly because we're smaller we can never uh, match them year on year we might make a breakthrough every so often but it's it the, the, the fact of the matter is that there's some equalization you can do, but throwing money at a problem is not the solution. I think it's a little more sophisticated than that. And that's why Ballyhale isn't the biggest club population in the country. They still have the, the best club team and have had for the last time. You have clubs in Galway that didn't, hadn't huge bases either, or at times. And um, you, have a, you, you have the... the um, the Galway football champions um, as well for, for the last number of years were the most significant team, not necessarily from the biggest base either. So more hard work has a place as well. Yeah, I'd say there's a little bit of equalisation could happen, but throwing money at it is not the answer. Planning, careful planning and hard work count every bit as much um, as, as throwing money at it and hiring people to do jobs that could be done by volunteers. There's a couple of positive comments coming in here. Um, great to hear Liam. Uh, he was a great president and didn't want the limelight. And thanks for the great shows. Appreciate you saying this. M. Um, Long saying, interesting to hear from a GA perspective. They rarely get the credit for their work. Uh, before we let you go, Liam, and we'll come back to Clock Balacala in a second, but Port Arlington are in a club, uh, yeah. Leinster Club semi final this weekend. I mean, my memory of Port Arlington is getting the train up and down from Tipperary to Dublin and seeing the, the, the factory there with the porridge. They're out against Kilmacud Croaks this weekend. Can you tell us a bit about Port Arlington as a club? Port Arlington is um, a club that's hemmed in between um, the rural end of the parish, is St. Joseph, is, um, is uh, Kilnard, and uh, Odense is, is the name of their club. And uh, they have a very big population base out there. Um, Port Arlington are in the town, and then you have Grey Seal at the far side. Um, who are great awfully champions over the year, the year. So they wouldn't have a, although Bertrand is a big town, they wouldn't have as big a base as you might expect. But uh, they've, always, they've always been a fantastic um, football population there. They were in the shadow of Port Leisha, as were most other clubs in Leash for a number of years. 
uh, they've come out now and in the last this year and last year have shown their true metal. Um, they're a great club. They're a strong club. They have a lovely, lovely grounds over there. They've been working away for years, and um, it's great that they're out now. They're they're a fit team. Um, they play lovely football, and um, they won't fear. They won't fear. Um, and I say this not in a bragging sort of way, but they'll have a certain inner confidence facing the Dublin champions. You know, leash leash clubs, and indeed leash teams, don't fear Dublin as much, maybe as we should. But over the years, we've been willing to take them on. You know, we, and I mean. Go back to Club Bella College. They're playing a Dublin champ. They beat the Dublin champions last week. A couple of years ago, it was a major shock to some people's minds that Leash beat Dublin in the in the in the in the championship. It wasn't to those who look at the history of it because we could always put it up to Dublin teams. Leash club sides, Port Leisha included, have put it up to Dublin clubs over the years, and they have a very good record. Um, not every year, but they have a good enough record against them. So for time to will go out and they'll have a go. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if they beat them. Now they might, they mightn't go the other way. But look, it's um, they're there. That's the great thing about sport. In a two-horse race, only one can win. But it can be the underdog at times. Yes, they are the underdogs. But they'll get great support for Leash and great goodwill. And we love our days out. We we support our clubs, no matter what club represents Leash. We will support them, and we support them for Leash over the years, even though. It, People had to swallow a little bit to do it because they were so successful, you know. But it's a great novelty to have Port Arlington in Croke Park, and I think it's a and to have Cluck Balacol in Croke Park as well. And I have to say, I was involved with Leinster County, and I know of many friends there still. But isn't it wasn't it a fantastic move by Leinster County to say, yeah, let's put our clubs? We have an opportunity here because of the way crowd control is now, and we have to be careful how we manage crowds. But anybody who wants to get to Croke Park and anybody in Leash or in Dublin, um, who are in Kilkenny, who want to bring children to Croke Park and get the feel of the place. They'll have the place, not say quite to themselves, but they'll have the the, the, the freedom of Croke Park to go, go and enjoy the place and maybe get the thrill that will bring them back again. But I think it's an absolutely fantastic initiative to have the best playing surface in Europe, in ways, at this time of the year, and to have that at the disposal of our clubs was a fantastic idea. And it's something we actually should do more of. Do you, do you like what's happening with the split season? It's probably going to be July next year when the All-Ireland is. Like, where can the club go? Because to me, if it's there for half the year now, clubs, they will actually have their players for longer, their county players for longer. That will help lift the standards, I think, across all club teams. And to me, it'll become more commercially appealing to big companies. I could see um, the club game really taking off from here. What are your thoughts on that? I hope you're right. Um, I I don't approach change with hesitancy um, much. I was worried about this, that it might, that we lost September. We really had the media. We had the focus of the world in September. Um, I didn't object to it. I didn't speak against it. I was worried. And this is the worry of change when you make changes. I think the possibilities are greater than the initial worry would have suggested and it'll work out fine and i think it's good to bring it back to the club we spent long enough saying the club mattered but our actions didn't show it now i think we have a little bit we have the thing in better balance now and um if we if we're wrong we can always revert but i think it's great that we have tried it i think it's great to put the club player first and yes it, it'll mean greater exposure for clubs and for the ordinary person who plays Gaelic games. You know, only two percent play inter county, the rest of us have to be satisfied with our club lives. But the fact that there is more focus now on that, I think, is a huge fillip. And I think that it'll also help the, the, the women's game when that expands, uh, when the emphasis is on the club, because that'll be seen as something that people can aspire to and achieve. And I think. Look, it's it was it's one I give a hesitant vote to, but I think it's worth pursuing. And I think, as you say, I think the the um, the possibilities outweigh the risks. And I think that's where that's where good change happens when you find a formula where the possibilities outweigh the risks. And I, th I think anyway, it's a risk worth taking. Yeah, Michael, do you have any final questions before we let Liam go? 
No, just one last one, Liam. Um, uh, you mentioned there about some kind of perks or positives of the job. Is there anything in particular, one perk of being GA president where you're just like, Jesus, if I wasn't GA president, there's no way I'd be here or no way I'd be doing this. Is there anything, any one particular memory or one particular perk that stands out? I think the big thing is the people you get to meet. Um, I'm an extremely, probably, I'm not now. I was an extremely shy person. I had to throw that cloak off me when I became president of the GA. I was an extremely shy person. I was forced to go out and meet people in front for the organization in a way that I wouldn't have had a chance before. And it was a huge learning experience. It was frightening at times, daunting at times. Standing in front of 80,000 people, hoping you won't make a mistake uh, is worrying, you know. And then you go abroad and you speak and uh, you go down to places like Shan Moor, you go to, as I said, Ballygar and Galway. And you hope it's worth people's while coming to hear you because you're going to say something that actually matters to them yeah but the, the big things was that the people i got to meet i got to meet great people and i loved going out and meeting the people on the ground and having the chat with them and just hearing their stories and hearing the ordinary people not those of course i had respect for those who were winners and got things easy and were showered with accolades but i love meeting the ordinary person on the ground who works for our organization who does the simple thing does it well and does it for love of their own place and that's one of the best nights um every year was the presidential award the president's awards where you got a chance to meet people who did great things um you know one of my one of the people i i was delighted to be associated because you do get to nominate some people because of your position um but one person i got an absolute huge trip was a fellow um called colin bell from down whose son kevin died in new york and he started this organization where he repatriated people and it took off and the man's generosity in sharing what happened the, the the awfulness of what happened to his son to found an organization to relieve the stress in so many families runs into hundreds now at the moment but i was delighted to be able to give him recognition that sort of thing gives you a buzz because you he mightn't have got it otherwise and i spoke about him in the doyle when i went in there as well and i was glad to be able to give recognition to that and that's where as an ordinary person i suppose meeting people being inspired by them it's nice to give them the recognition too and i'd have memories i i, I still meet people who will come up to you and say oh, you know we have a picture of you up, up on our mantelpiece because you gave such a thing to our child back or whatever you know and you just think to yourself you know you can't remember them all you couldn't possibly but you sort of think well that mattered to that person at that time or maybe the little chat i had with somebody yeah so look as i said they the it was a huge thrill i feel hugely privileged to have led the organization it is the most fantastic organization in the world and all you do is every time you see it, you just hope that's going to continue to prosper. And I think it will because we have great people. We still have love of place. A love of place is the most is the, is the strongest thing. And it matters in the GA. People will do things for their own place they would not do if you paid them a fortune. Because it's the people who run Trummer Hurling Club, Trummer GA Club, do that for Trummer. They would not do it for anyone else. It's for their place. And it matters to them and that's what drives us all and i think that's what drives you working in the media too and you're really fortunate to have the jobs you have you know this you're living it every day those of us who are in administration live it while we're elected and then we have to step aside you know but you live this every day and it must be a huge thrill too i think you probably understand that better than most because you share the experience with us yeah absolutely well look it's been absolutely brilliant having you on as patrick hickey says here good chat with a true ga man so uh, again, congrats on your tenure and really appreciate you joining us and best of luck to the Leash team this um, weekend. I, I enjoyed that. I just want you to know I'm absolutely exhausted after that. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, Liam. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liam. We'll chat to you again. Thanks, right. man. Brilliant to have uh, Liam O'Neill on there, Trummer man and uh, obviously former GEA president. We'll have Davy Burke, um, former Wicklow manager, on in a minute. But uh, just to finish off the, our chat on Ballyhale against uh, Clock Balacala, Ballyhale's dominance in the in the Leinster Championship since coming basically since first winter title in '78 is unbelievable. Oh, it's savage, yeah. I just went down through it there. Um, Pat Dunnigan, who's uh, at Planet of the Herbs on Twitter, just went down through uh, some stats uh, before their semi-final, before they played St. Rhinus last Sunday. And it's amazing when you go down through it. Ballyhale have played 44 times in Leinster since winning uh, the Kilkenny Senior Hurling title in 1978. They've won 36 of them, they've drawn one, and they've lost seven. 
Uh, they've won three of those games after extra time and, and that replay that they played against Ratnor, I think it was in the 80s, uh, after the draw, they won that as well. So they've lost like seven times. I'm uh, you know, proud to say that I think two of them are to borrow one in the 1991 Leinster final actually when we gave them a good trimming that was it we were coming of age and they were probably on the way out uh, they've get subsequently given us a few trimmings <laughs> since now in fairness and we beat them in 2007 I think too uh, you know Owlert have, have beaten them uh, I think Kennedy beat them Rhinus beat them uh, I'm probably forgetting one or two there but it's a phenomenal record uh, as well and, and Pat just went through the uh, Ballyhale aggregate scores um, since the preliminary stage of the Kilkenny Championship as well and just what we were saying earlier like Joe Cudahy 214 from play Owen Cody 320 Brian Cody 17 points like Colin Fenley's down well down with with 3-4 Adrian Mullen on 110 so like you, you know if Clark are to win um, outside of TJ Reid who was 143 25 frees and 265s uh, stopping Owen Cody, you'd say, and Brian Cody rampaging forward to get his three or four a game is, is going to be huge. But I can't, I can't wait for that game. I think there's like I, I think Ballyhale will have gotten a big warning, another scare again last weekend, and it'll come out and deliver a performance. And then part of you thinks, um, maybe th- like these are not just like warning signs, maybe there's a red light saying like that they're in a bit of trouble, but we'll get all our answers on Sunday. Yeah, and a couple of the Kilmanic lads have weddings the week of the Munster final. There's a, a wedding issue for, well, more of a honeymoon issue for Willie Highland too. Uh, Willie Dunphy, yeah. He, um, Sorry, Willie Dunphy. he, he postponed his, uh, he's supposed to be um, going on an absolute holiday of a lifetime with, with his wife, his uh, new wife, uh, Neve. But uh, that's all been put on, on the back burner. Um, so he should be in Mexico at the moment, as he says himself, drinking out tall glasses with little umbrellas in them, toasting the good life. But he um he postponed that for Clock Bala College club run. Um and he just said here, I should be in Cancun now drinking cocktails on a beach. Um it was a hard decision. I had my mind made up after the county final that if we were to beat Rapparees in Leinster Club, that I was going to go on honeymoon then because I've put a lot of things on hold for hurting throughout my life and I really wanted to enjoy the two weeks that we were going away. Um, it was a hard decision, but I would have also said if we beat Crokes and got to the final at Crow Park, I was going to be it was going to be one of the best decisions uh, that we ever made. Thankfully, it turned out to be one of the greatest wins our club has ever had. And just they've changed their honeymoon plans. Their honeymoon new plans are um, he says we're booked now to go on Stevens's day, um, but we'll see how next weekend goes. We're on a roller coaster at the minute, so I hope they don't have to put it off again. But that could be a very real possibility and. Listen, it, it wouldn't be, I suppose it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they had to put it off because of success. But I think part of that as well, you have to pay uh, massive tribute to um, wives, partners, girlfriends, families who are so understanding of the commitments involved in GA. And, um, you know, fair play to them for, for putting it off for a couple of weeks. But uh, it could be all worth it by five or six o'clock Sunday evening. I'd say the poor wife, uh, the whole town looking at her if she tried to force him to go. So I think yeah, there you go. Yeah, it position. wouldn't be worth it. Sure, it wouldn't. <laughs> the poor, the poor lady in an untenable position. We'll come back and talk about the Ulster hurling final and the Camogie All Ireland final in a short while. But we have Davy Burke here, the uh, former Wicklow manager, led Sarsfield South County title a couple of years ago in Kildare, and also the under twenties in Kildare Town All Ireland title in twenty eighteen. Davy, how are you doing? How are you, lads? Are you well? Good, no. good, great to have you on. Shall we jump straight into the Leinster Club semi-finals this weekend? Uh, Nace, a, a team you'd know very well, up against Shell Maliers in a in a Leinster Club semi-final, and I mean, like Nace's story is obviously fairly mental that they're they're coming here managerless. Yeah, yeah, Nace are extremely lucky. They've two seriously <coughs> seriously experienced guys in Owen Doyle and um, Eamon Callahan. They seem really seem to be carrying this at the minute, you know, and they really seem to be driving everything on. And I know I actually spoke to Owen in the last week and. He's a serious, serious operator, so you give nothing but serious credit to them boys, you know. Um, but it's a very, very unique situation. But whatever happened there throughout the year, about 10 or 12 weeks ago, it seems to have galvanized them and it seems to be closer even more. And I have to say, Shane, I think they're a very, very dangerous, uh, very, very dangerous uh, opposition for anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like even that um, that fixture they had against Tullamore, they were gone. And then Dara Kerwin blocks somebody down and it ends up in the back of the net and they're through. Oh, I've never seen anything like it. Oh my God, uh, Ricochet! Like nothing else, it was phenomenal. It, it, the luck involved in it—you'll you'll never see it again. It never be matched again. It was just a block, 
14 or 15 yards out from goal and just scuttered into the net. It was poor old Tullamore, I have to say, poor old Tullamore. But look, let, you know, interprovincial football at the time, it, 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 it's it, it's a crazy foot. You're never over the line. You're never home until the whistle goes and at this time of the year. So, uh, look, they're still there and they're, they're, they're going well. Yeah, Just Mike. what you said, Davy, about them being dangerous, um, like getting over the getting that monkey off your back and winning a county final, the first one in I think it was 30 years, having you know a lot of dirty petrol in the tank probably against Tullamore, still managing to get over the line. Then they produce great stuff against Blessington, like they are a dangerous proposition. And just because they're not, you know, they haven't been in a Leinster club in a long time, maybe they're probably not getting the credit that they deserve. Yeah, but maybe if you're outside the county, if you're inside the county, everyone knows there's a beast uh, coming here big time. And I like they're a super club for want of a better word. They're every bit as big as Kilmacool Croaks in these clubs now. Like their underage hurlers are playing down in Kilkenny at the minute. Like, so this is a serious, serious weapon of a club that is only ready. And now they've got their head. So the likes of the Newbridge clubs, the Selbridge, the Atai now have serious, serious uh, opposition from these guys because now they've. They've, they've experienced senior success. Having won every minor, every 21, every 16, for as long as I can remember, these guys would have won it all the way up, just couldn't get over the line at senior level. So now, I'm moving on particularly, Michael, into Crow Park. Crow Park, if it was ever made for a team, it was made for this nice team, you know? So um, um, I, I, I really, really do think they're dangerous for, for the whole country, now, to be honest. Just a quick oh. question, Davey. You obviously know um, the demands of being a manager and how much energy that takes. Can you believe like that they're, That the two boys who are still playing are balancing this with... And I'm sure they've got loads of help with guys that aren't playing. But it is a mad one. There's an awful lot of organisation involved in it. Uh, and for those guys to be able to keep uh, their focus on well, what they're doing on the pitch, because they are, and while keeping everything else going in the background, it's phenomenal, really. It is phenomenal. And look, to be honest with you, I don't know if they've been tested that much yet. They went eight points to one up in the county final against Sarsfields, you know, which you probably wouldn't have been expecting. And we're kind of always holding on from there on, really, right? Then uh, into Tullamore, I know Owen Doyle went off himself with a knock early on, came back on. Tullamore got two quick goals and they just got over the line there. And then the last day, look, it was an understrength blessing in team and, you know, they were half cosy the whole way through it. So my big fear for them on the field, I have no fear for them, but off the field, if it comes to crunch time, you know, 10, 15 minutes to go. Who's really going to make the calls then? If Owen Doyle's wrapping up, you know, whoever Owen Doyle will be put on, you know, he can't really be thinking about who to take off and who to take on as well. And he hasn't got a clear picture in his head about what's going on. Let's be honest about it. So, uh, yeah, my, my fear for them would be on the line. Now, there is Karma Kerwin and, and Cribben is involved there as well. So they do have a couple of good men involved too. But um, I think it is Owen's show. So very much you're talking about water breaks half time there, Michael. I think that uh, they'll have to do the rejigging, you know. Yeah, Davey, when you're on these sort of club runs, the chances sometimes are you're going to come up against a team that you don't know that well. You know, you play in a county championship. If you're, you know, you're back over Sarsfields again for next year, you take on Nace. You know the colour of the underpants that the lads are wearing, probably. Whereas yeah. now they're coming up against Shell Maliers and, you know, they've been on TV maybe once or twice in the last few years. But chances are they don't know all that much about them. But that, that's the beauty of the province for me and, and every province because, it, you know, there's only, there's only limited video and you're ringing every club manager, I'm sure, in Wexford looking for, for footage to see who'll do your deal or what he's interested in or whatever's going on. <laughs> and uh, look, you try to do your best to get everything. And, you know, lads in colleges, swap, tell you them colleges are dangerous grounds, uh, swapping information players and whatever else. You, you know yourself, you go anywhere to find what you need to find. But um, yeah, I think, honestly, I do think that's the beauty of it. That's why it's such a great competition. I think that's why you get upsets. The level of homework isn't as detailed because obviously we don't have the information on each other that you'd have on your local rivals. But um, it's it really is a class competition and uh, Nace really have their dander up now anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mikey, do you want to jump in? No, I, ju I do think that's fascinating. You sound, I'd say there's a bit of a Del Boy in you, Davey, but it sounds the things you'd wheel or deal to get any information you can anywhere. <laughs> yeah, look, look, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you, have to, you have to do what you can, Michael, to get over the line, you know? That's a fact, so yeah. Davey, like the way you're talking about Nace, you, it seems like you fancy him to have a right go at this Leinster Championship, but everyone seems to be just assuming that Kilmacud Croaks will come through and win this thing. The aristocrats, the big name, the super club. I mean, you're saying that Nace is a bit of a super club too, but sorry, you sort of smiling at the notion that everyone is pretty much seeing it as a done deal for Kilmacud. Yeah, absolutely. I would be, yeah, absolutely. Particularly in Crow Park, I think uh, this, this Nace side is athletically up there with anyone. They'd be equally as athletic as a, as a Croaks or any any team in the country. I'd say maybe the likes of a Kilku who look very, very, very athletically gifted now. But um, other than, I'd have absolutely no concerns whatsoever with uh, with this nice team taking on. Now, first of all, 
Chameleers are going to be a big challenge because they're going to match up very similarly. They're going to be defensive side and they look to break and they have four or five county players across the middle that they'll use as well to, you know, break a pace. But I just don't think they'll have the scoring power outside of uh, own Nolan, who I'm sure Doyle will pick up himself. And in fairness, at club level, there's probably very few better man markers than own Doyle at club level at the minute. So, um, um, I think Chameleers might fall short on the scoring power, which 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 I think Nace will have in abundance, you know. I just have a word on, on Dara Kerwin, um, Davey. I, just, I saw him last year against Offaly. He was outstanding. I saw him at different stages this year. He's brilliant for Nace as well. Um, like, how much potential has this guy got? Like, to me, he has left and right. He has size, able to take scores from anywhere. He And he's, he's obviously very young and still quite raw, but he looks like someone that could have serious potential at county level over the next six or seven years. Yeah, he, he's he's as good as a young full forward in the country, Michael, in my opinion. He, I have to say, I was concerned two years ago, I was concerned about him. He uh, he wasn't, the work rate wasn't there. I'd be, I'd be keen on lads who'll, 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 who'll work as well as kick the scores. And, you know, his tracking wasn't brilliant. I have to say he's added a huge a work ethic into his game now. In the county semi-final, they came under the pump for a couple of minutes against Minute County semi-final, um... He came out and won two marks, key marks, and drove forward, turned over a ball, tracking back, all the while probably kicking one seven. You know, so he really now is starting to become the real deal for me. One thing that Dara is, he's, he's a, he, as a manager, he probably frustrates you a little bit in that he will kick wides. Every game he will kick, you know, two, three, four wides. But the one thing with Dara, he's no shortage car, he'll keep kicking. And that's and that's that's the thing. And and a fairness to him, he's a lethal full forward and he's as good as he's as good as there is, as I know, as a young twenty two year old in the country, you know. Where where do you think his, his trajectory is going? Like how good can he be? How good can he be? Oh, he can honestly I think he can be as good as there is. Honestly, I think uh, I, I, I don't see I don't see anything. I think he could be all star material in a couple of years' time, provided, as I said, he's added that work right in now, right? He's added that effort into his game now. Now he needs to keep that going and he needs to find a new level now, you know, because he's fine at club level doing all this work and it's working out fine for him. But now at the inter-county level, when the physical stakes and the conditioning is higher again, well, that's going to be Dara's next challenge, you know, to really step up to that. But uh, I, I, I honestly think he'd, he'd, have no, he'd have no worries there. Yeah, and if you think of the potential of him, and then obviously we've seen Daniel Flynn for years. I mean, the athlete he is, the footballer he is. I know you were in the conversation for the, the Kildare job, of course. Like, where do you think Kildare can get to because you know obviously Dublin in charge for so long and Leinster but Kildare f- have felt like a sleeping giant oh like, there's no doubt the potential in Kildare is is is, is unlimited for me I uh, I think it's a very very exciting job I thought and still do think at the minute it's the most exciting job in the country because probably haven't really achieved what 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 the potential is there to achieve in the last number of years and uh, I do obviously got promoted and accepted made a Leinster final but made a Leinster final and parked the bus and you know lost by 10 points or 8 points or whatever it was in the end without ever having a cut you know for me that's not really going out and giving it anything you know so uh, particularly against a Dublin team that looked to be on the decline I think so um, um, for me the, the, the potential is endless until there uh, we have some seriously seriously talented footballers I think we're hungry as well for success as a county I think the people will get behind the new team and um yeah, I, I honestly look at if you forward the likes of Dara, the likes of Daniel Flynn, Jimmy Highland, Player of the Year, 2018 or 20 All Ireland. Like we have serious, serious forward play there, uh, players there, and um, and even in the back line, Kevin Flynn is an All Star and waiting in my opinion. Or Kevin Feely, you know, we really have some good players. Mick O'Grady. So look, I I I I would have nothing but positive things to say, and I I do really think Kildare will challenge. Um, look. They've tough in Division One this year, Shane. No matter who went in, if I was there, or the Pope was there. It doesn't make any difference. Division One was going to be tough this year, regardless of what. what no matter who went in there, so um, uh, let's hope they can they can hang on there for the year that's in it. But I do believe there's a good crack at Leinster in this team, and I probably should be winning in Leinster, or could be winning in Leinster in the next year or two. You know, really, yeah. Do, do you know? Well, uh, like uh, some people would say that Dublin are going to bounce back hard next year because of how this year went. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, maybe they will, but is is that bounce in them? You know, is is the hunger is the hunger gone? You don't know. Like, have you know, if they've six or seven or eight All Ireland medals between them, you know, a couple of retirements. For my for my reading of the Dublin scene, you know, they don't seem to have. You know, there's the Collie Bascals coming through. They just don't seem to be coming through with the same caliber as what what, what is left. You know, and um, so for me. Yes, that Dublin team is there. Of course, they're going to come back with a bounce. Of course, Desi's going to come back with a point to prove. But I, I don't think there's fear factor there for the Meads or the Kildare's, to be honest with you, as much as it was. It wouldn't be in my book, anyway. Uh, just, Davy, with the enthusiasm you have for the Kildare football team, was there? I know you, you, you made no, uh, you made no um, hiding the fact that you would have loved the job. Was there a good bit of disappointment after that? I absolutely, yeah. And I put, I put a huge effort in, Michael. And, and, and look, look, 
it was as simple as that. I wear my heart in my sleeve. I went for the job. I had a good crack at it. I felt to put a good team together and uh, yeah, put put together a decent plan. And look, you don't get it. You don't get what you're looking for all the time. So uh, yeah, I'd look, I would have been down for a while. I would have taken a break away with herself and just trying to forget about football for a while. And look, uh, I'm not going to lie, club football wasn't where I wanted to be in 2022. Uh, it's, I'm back with Tarsis now and I'm very happy to be back there. But I, I did have my eyes set on uh, being involved in the county level, you know. But um, look, you, you never know what will come your way again, you know. Do you take mm. solace from the fact that Jim McGuinness didn't get it first time around? Jim Gavin didn't get it first time around either. This is this, this is my second time around, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, no. Look, look, absolutely, absolutely. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see where we end up. And look, I, I've nothing but I hope Glenn and the lads like me and Glenn would have been a regularish contact, and you know we'd bounce ideas off each other and look at the, the, the best of luck to the lads, you know. Mm. So I'm looking at the the other fixture then, Kilmacud Croaks against Port Arlington, and I've seen Croaks, uh, I've seen them live a few times this year. And they are impressive. And, you know, they saw the job off the last day out um, against Wolf Tones. Do you, do you see Port Arlington, who had a very impressive county final here, and obviously they've made their way to this stage too. Do you see them putting up a strong challenge? Yeah, I do. I do see Port Arlington. I think they're a good side. I think they're a very, very well coached side. They dispatched the Port Leash handily enough in, in a final and then, you know, came through a very seasoned Lomans team the last day. Uh, absolutely, I see. I see Port Arlington now for Port Arlington flipping it on from the nice cause. I'd say I prefer if I was Port Arlington manager for this to be in a provincial ground. To be honest with you, um, I, I, if I was over them, I'd rather this to be tight, mucky, and uh, let's dig it out. To be honest with you, but um, I, I, I think you get into like the croaks into croaker, and 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 you know you 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 could be in a bit of bother at, at stages, you know. And is, I mean, there's a lot of that down to just trying to contain. Paul Mannion, like there's other good players there. Shane Cunningham is, is one that stands out. Shane Horn, uh, Darren Mullen. They have a lot of class, but Paul Mannion, really. They're six, they're six forwards, Shane, have all played into county football at least underage, if not senior. That'll tell you the quality you're dealing with there, you know. And, um, you know, but they, yeah, obviously, look, the team Port Arlington have that, that is they've Robbie Piggott, right? And he will absolutely go a long way towards minimizing and neutralizing Mannion, you know, as, as, as much as anyone will. Now, Mannion's at home in his playground in Croker now. That's another side of it. So, um, um, you know, he obviously is very comfortable there and obviously will, will you know, know the ground very well. But I do think Robbie Pickett, with his physical level, with his level of conditioning and his physicality, I think he can he can upset Mannion as much as anyone can, to be honest with you. So, um, I do think that's a, that's an ace up Port Arlington sleeve. And in young Bennett in the corner, I think they have a very, very good cornerback as well. They're a very, very well-coached side. You can clearly see Joyce plays on the 11 from. You can see inside Colin Murphy's the danger man inside. I, uh, they, they, these will these will give uh, Croaks to fill of it. And I didn't think Croaks looked all that impressive against Tones. Um, um, you know, they got the job done. But the, the fear with the likes of a Croaks is... You look at Bally Bowden, right? Wanted to go toe to toe, and they just blew them away, right? You look at the Jude's who set up to contain them, and there's no team better in Ireland probably than Jude's at that game, right? And 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 they done it for 58, 59 minutes, and ultimately still wasn't enough. And then you went into Tones who tried to contain them, and it was a bit they, they got chewed out a bit handier. You can't just set up a defensive screen against, you know, you can't just work on it for two weeks against the likes of Kim Croaks. They'll just cut you open, you know. So um, I I I I um, I just would have concerns on that front, but I do think they're a very very well coached team. Mm. Mike? Yeah, no, I think it's going to be interesting. Martin Murphy, that manages Port Arlington, has four leash titles now, too, with Stradbally. Um, obviously, Port are the same as Clock Ball, I call in the Hurling, in that they've won two county titles in the space of about 12 weeks. They're probably better placed and uh, maybe this year to go into uh, the provincial campaign than they would have been last year um, and they're on a bit of a crest of a wave and as you say uh, Davey like beating Lomans beating a seasoned team who've been in a provincial final are very unlucky against Moorfield a couple of years ago have been there thereabouts have some you know real top quality players it's funny going down through the Port Harrington team it doesn't like outside of maybe the likes of Robbie Piggott you're not thinking there's a load of guys here that stand jump off the page that are leash inter county footballers but that's not necessarily what you need, you know, at club level. It's clear that they have a really, really well rounded team and that's what you need. Uh just wondering, Davey, like if you're if you're looking at like is there much chance of an upset here or do an awful lot of things have to go right for Port Haring to pull it off? Yeah, I, to be honest, I can't see an upset. I can't see a very competitive game and probably a more competitive game than, you know, maybe even the bookies or the general public might think, as in, because they are, they're going to be well set up. They do have a very, very good inter-county man marker to, to minimise Paul Mannion. But uh, yeah, I just think the likes of Craig Diaz, Andy McGowan, you know, Keen O'Connor, Callum Pearson, Jesus, you imagine having them boys coming off the bench at any at any team in the country. It's phenomenal what they have. So um, um, the depth there and 
even even to be a dual club and have one overlapping player is frightening. It, it's absolutely frightening. So so look, the depth and I just believe the depth will be too much and Crokes will pull away. But I I think it'll be tighter than a lot of people think. Mm, so you're looking at an ace Kilmacud uh, Leinster final. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I think nice Kevin Cole. One thing on Port Ireland, and actually they've they've went into blister and leads against Port Leash and against Lomans. I think they went one went six points up against Lomans, I think. And then Lomans decided to put a squeeze on the kick out. And if anyone watching Dublin Club football, they, they they're obsessed with opposition presses and pressing on keepers. So um I think if if Crokes put the press on, I think Long or uh, Port Ireland could have a long day if 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 they press from early on, you know. Yeah, and like, do you, how much do you weigh up pressing the kick out when you're setting up against a team? Are there some days where you're like, there's no point in trying to press up on this team? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's one of the main focuses I'd always have going into when I'm preparing to go into a game, but you have to be very, very careful. If you're going in to play Rory Began, too many presses aren't going to work because he's going to go over you. You know, you're going to Sean Patton, Rory Began, they're going to go clean over the top of you. So obviously, you're, if you're still going to press, you have to, and against a team like that, you might concede the ball to the corner and try defend them from there or set traps or whatever you might try to do all the way along, you know. But uh, it will be hugely, hugely important for me. But it's very much based on the team and the kick out of, and the plan that's in place. And if you look around the country, I think it's a huge part of the game. Opposition kickouts now and your own kickouts are probably two of the key facets of the game. And and training wise, they would take up, geez, it must be 40% of your training now at this stage, I'd say. Yeah, if you if you don't have a goalkeeper who can't hit the mark from his kickouts, you're probably it's very difficult to win games against top opposition. Yeah, again, you might you might get through your county or you might depending on the quality of opposition, you might. But the minute you step into a provincial game or a provincial uh, you know sphere, you've no chance. You, you got to be able to mix it up. You have to be able to go short, medium, long. You, you know, you have to be able to go over the top. You have to be able to overload. You have to have the confidence. You know, you, you can see the goal. You need to secure that ball. Can the keeper think it to the two or the four? And look, that's why we're seeing the likes of Niall Morgan, the likes of Began, all these boys, Cluxton, their profile has gone through the roof because they're so, so good, so, so accurate. And now they're quarterback in their teams. Now they're coming out the field. Now I'm not sure if, I'm, if I'd if i have the same confidence in, <laughs> in allowing Began come up the field all the time or any of that kind of crack. I'm not sure if I'm I've built up the same way as them boys. But uh, they're, they're now becoming every bit as important as your marquee forward now because they, they, they're, they're your restart man, you know? But like it's very rare. Like how how often do goalkeepers make saves these days? Could you may, maybe restyle an outfielder to be a really good kickout merchant and maybe be able to take the forty fives? But someone who's got a brilliant wand of a foot for kickouts, who's essentially an outfield player who can play as that fifteenth outfield player. Ab- absolutely, and, and, and going and that way. Retired, like it, it's even something that uh, retire at club level, for example, you might even look at bringing a retired dad back. He might be 37, 38, 39, for whatever age, and he's still relatively fit and he gets two feet. For me, if you can stand over the ball and think left, think right, it's a huge tool to have, a huge asset to have. So you're keeping the opposition guessing and you know, they can't overload or they can't do whatever you want them to do, you know, or sorry, whatever they're thinking you're going to do. So, um, um yeah, absolutely. The shot stopping end of it's. Uh, if you're if it's put like this, Shane, if you're can if your keeper is making three, four, five saves a game while your defensive screen or defensive setup is quite poor. So um um, you know, that's the way I'd look at it. So yeah, it's really gone to I would I would argue it's 80-20 now. Keeper needs to be able to kick the ball out 80%. It needs to be um his focus and 20% for the one or two saves he's gonna make. Mm, interesting, Michael. Davey, just on, on your own managerial career, um, you're obviously a very young man uh, for over the last past four years, I think. Well, have you an All Ireland under twenty title, a Kildare title, and you have two two years with with Wicklow, uh, one of which you won promotion in. Um, how did you get started in coaching? Was that something? Was it like early to mid twenties, or what age did you start? At? You're from it's you're Confi originally, Confie, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah Confi man, yeah. Um, no, so yeah, I, I look, it's a mad story. I, my my father would have been heavily involved. My mother and father would have been founding members of Confi, and my dad would have uh, managed St David's in the Hogan Cup and in, in the good Dublin's club there. Uh, sorry, school, not club, and uh, whatever. So we would have been involved all the way up. But I I done my cruise ship, Michael twice by by fifteen, and uh, that was. That was unfortunately the end of that, you know. So I um there was no I went for an X-ray instead of an MRI. Look, it's different times to be honest with you. And uh I ended up with a plastic kneecap. So look very, very quickly in my house it was it's work or football or preferably both. And that's your only real options you had back in the day. So um so look, I went straight into it over minor over under 14 teams in the club, 16 teams in the club, and I, I believe I could be wrong here, but I think I'm the youngest recipient ever of a award one level GA course. I think I was 15 on it, just just decided to get it done just so I, I could, you know, move on a bit. So, and I have to say, I have to give a shout out to uh, 
Maria Fallon and Comfy Senior Lady. She's a chairperson still to this day. I think she is. And uh, she gave me my big break in when I was 18 years of age. She entrusted me now to manage our senior ladies team, which uh, was fair going. And I took fair confidence in her. Now, uh, fairly, she marked me tight and probably, probably was the right thing to do. But um, um, she gave me a break. And, and now you're dealing with players, top, top quality, Anya Gately, Ashley Jennings, Deirdre Gately. We weren't dealing with an average club side there, you know. So um, we would have had a run at Leinster and different things. But long story short, that's how we got started. And, 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 by the time I was uh, 21 or two, I had four or five good years at senior level done. And, um, um, you know, I was ready to go into underage men's and worked up from there, to be honest. And I'm, I'm, I'm not finished yet either. <laughs> oh, you're far from finished. I'd say you're only, you're only getting started by the sounds of things. Um, I, I remember you did, a, a, I think, a piece, I think it was with Maliki Clark in there not too long ago in the Times about, like, not being, you're all, you're all energy. By all, like, it's, it's all energy. Um. Does that sometimes affect uh, not your own health, but your own well-being? Sometimes the, the amount of energy that you have to put into, particularly into the county management, the amount of things you have to do behind the scenes. Forget about even what's going on in the pitch for that, you know, two hours, three or four times a week. But how demanding is that on yourself as well? Oh, it's hugely, hugely demanding. There's no point. Uh, there's no point dressing it up, Michael. It's it, 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 the mental toll. The physical toll, absolutely. Like I, I said at the Malachi, so like I've no problem saying with Manute Sigerson at the minute there. Like I'll drive forty minutes to go watch them in a six a.m. gym session, you know, to oversee that. But would I get up and drive five minutes to go to the gym to do my own gym session? Would I? No way. So it, it's a weird psyche, as I said, you know, and it's just something as a manager I'm stuck in, and I'm sure there's another hundred managers like me in the country that are kind of in that mindset, you know. So absolutely, but the mental toll, the phone calls, the Ah, oh, the nonsense that goes on, you know, it, 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 uh, that that takes a big toll, obviously, and then and then the energy levels are down because when you're so ramped up and so high, and 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 obviously there's a come down off that. It's like anything, you know. And football for me is like a drug. It's it's where I get a serious bounce out of a serious kick out of, and obviously like anything that that comes up, it comes down as well, you know. So uh, and obviously there's knock on effects at home to all that, and there's everything, you know. But but look. As I said previously, there's no one putting a gun to your head. There's a reason you do it. You obviously love it. There's obviously rewards. Um, I love dealing with people. I love the psychology end of things. I love, you know, um, understanding how to motivate one lad, might do it for the next lad, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And uh, so that's, yeah, but ultimately there would be, but but look, we can stop at any time, you know. Yeah. Davy, this this weekend you're, you're you've been taking a few sessions with Kilcock, who are up against Clara in the Leinster Intermediate semi final. How, how enjoyable has that been? And uh, just I suppose keeping your 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 toe in. Yeah, uh, just for context, I live in Kilcock the last seven years, so uh, the lads asked me to um, uh, come up and, and give them a hand say before the county semi final. They're playing Salons, and uh, yeah, it's a very very enjoyable bunch of lads. Now, to be honest with you, it's a senior it's a senior team, and they would have been beaten in a couple of finals the last couple of years. And you know, it was only a matter of clicking, really. To be honest with you, you know, they'd have real real quality and. Daniel Courtney, Jason Gibbons, Shane O'Rourke, Finley Nairn. Ah, they, they, it was a proper quality team now. And I'd imagine they'll make an impact in senior next year until they're like, for me, they won't be a team that will be looking to bounce back or anything like that. I'd imagine they'll be a very much safe, safe uh, middle team until they're next year, senior level. But hugely enjoyable. Only over the road, half the battle as well, you know. So, um, um, and obviously dealing with local lads. And it's a different level of football. Like intermediate football is obviously a little bit of a step down from what I would have been used to at coming from senior into county or even saying being involved in a Sigerson team it's it's a drop down but I tell you they, they work as hard as anyone they're uh, the six or seven real quality players there and for me again and I, you probably think I'm biased to, to Kildare if you look at the history in Kildare and Leinster and intermediate level they have a fair good record in it you know the Kildare Leinster or Kildare intermediate champion is very very strong and um, I would I would fancy them now I think they're underdogs this weekend and uh, hopefully we can do something about that but I would fancy them to, to keep going yeah and the other semi final is trim against Cross of Beg, uh, Ballymurn of Wexford. And in the junior, it's Castletown, Finney, Cool, Whitehall. There can't be too many names as long as that. They're <laughs> up against Kilcullen of Kildare. And O'Loughlin Gales of Kilkenny are against Clonbelog of Offaly. And I once did a skydive in Clonbelog, believe it or not. Nice. Uh, <laughs> we'll jump on to the Munster Football Championship this weekend. So the two semi finals are on Austin Stacks against Newcastle West and the Bars of Cork against. Aerog Ennis, who beat Lockmore Castellani a couple of weeks ago. Interestingly, for for Limerick clubs, there's no Limerick winner since Drum Collar Broadford in 2008 and Thomond College in 1977. Two other Limerick finalists since Monaline in 02 and Newcastle West in 87. I suppose, Davey, people will just assume that the, the Kerry team will get through here. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, whereas this is a decent side, this Newcastle West side. You know, the likes of Ian Corbett, as far as my was an all star nominee the last year or two. Um, you know, Keane Sheehan there. They, they, these are these are a good side. Jimmy Lee, I'm not certain on this, but he looks very like him. I reckon he could be a brother of Billy, I'd say, is he? I don't not know. The sure. manager could be, could be. Um, I, 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 I think you know, from my experience with Billy, I'd say this would be very well set up. So, um, um, oh, absolutely. The one concern I would have, having beaten the dare very cosily in in the county final, um, they came up at home to a weakened Nyer team without Jamie Barron and a couple more due to COVID, and uh, you know, struggled eight six to get over the line there at home. That would that would for me sound a few uh, warning signals going down to Tralee, you know. Yeah, um, Mike, do you reckon that Stacks can kick it on again here? Like they last won it in 2014 and they won it previously in 76. Uh, yeah, they also lost finals in 74 and 75. They don't tend to blow you away, Stacks. It's more of a more of a kind of an arm wrestle. Uh, I think the handicap is four or five here um, and it'll probably be in around that, but it could be a comfortable four or five, if you know what I mean, without like blitzing them. Like they don't usually win games. 214 to eight points or anything like that. It's usually more of a you know 15 11 or you know 16 11 that type of a thing. And I think it might be something similar. Uh, stacks are not unbelievably spectacular, but they continue to get the job done. And you, I'd have to say, uh, you know, all signs would suggest that they get the job done over Newcastle West at the weekend. The kind of one I just on that point, Michael, they're they're kind of short of marquee forward. Now I know it's weird to say that with Donahue in the team, but but I think Cairn's days of being a huge score and you know, Tread is kind of gone. Um, you know, Dara O'Brien would be the most dangerous forward, but but they're really based on the counter attack. They're a fairly defensive team, and if you watch them against Brendan's in the county final there, our semi final, and then Rahali's, you know, I think you know they're set up to to to, to break. They're set up, sorry, to uh, for for the counter, and you know they've serious engines in Brendan O'Sullivan, Greg Hoare, and Ronan Shanahan. These lads are on the middle, are quality quality club players, and then it's more getting Dara on the loop and getting Donahue up there in the diagonal. So. For me, that's why they're kind of winning 15 11. They're not, they're not really going to score a huge, huge amount. I wouldn't have thought with the way they're set up or with the quality of forward, maybe that's there. But um, they're they're a seriously well drilled and they're very, very cohesive side. And they look they look, do look a good threat, but I would be concerned later on will they have the score and threat when, again, like I said earlier, you meet a kill you meet a croaks who can defend and attack and to have a marquee up there, you know, I, I, would, I would worry then, you know. Yeah, uh, St. Finbar's have won two of the, the last three titles, I think, down in Cork. And obviously they have this glorious past in both codes and they were Munster football champions in 79, 80, 82 and 86. But, you know, there was that huge famine in terms of winning county titles. So they obviously haven't been in the Munster final since. Do you think that sometimes having that glorious past can hold you back then, hold on, hold, um, hold back that future generation that's coming through and make it more difficult, Davey? Yeah, absolutely. Like tradition can weigh on on, on on lads, particularly younger lads coming through. And, you know, there's the expectation that each year you should be repeating this, you know, and 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 the longer it goes, you know, the only the heavier it gets. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I do. And the Cork team be fairly disappointed, but with, with the exception of Nemo, obviously, you know, there anyone else who's ever come out, well, not ever, but in the last number of years came out of Cork has, has never really kicked on at all. And I think the Croaks give 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 the bars a bit of a hiding in, in eighteen there when they come out. So maybe they'll be they'll be you know out to put that right this year. But the problem with a Cork team and you know tipping them or talking them up, you never know what they're going to produce. You know you never know what's going to come out. So you know I'd be very very conservative and it you know would <laughs> it'd be one to watch for me now rather than getting involved in. Yeah, Michael, it's the twenty eighth of November since in St Finbar's won that county final third minute of the injury time. I think when Stephen Sherlock hit the winner against Clonakilty. So at least from their point of view, they've had a bit of time to sort of chill out and unwind after all that before trying to get up again for Air Oak. They have, yeah. I'd, I'd go. I'd echo what Davy said there. Like if you're looking back through, just say the the Munster uh, the Munster club football final record. You know, take take Nemo over the, the Cork record is quite poor. I think Castlehaven were beaten in the twelve final. And then you look at like I think Ennis have probably been underestimated. Uh, Milltown Malbay were in a final two years ago. Uh, Kilmurray of Brickham won it in 09. Cratlow were beaten in was it 13 as well. Like they've a good record at that level. And they were they were, you know, reasonably comprehensive winners of that county final against Kilmurray of Brickham. So like I think if there's probably going to be an upset this weekend, that this could potentially be be the one, you know. Um, and I think they're checking the prices before and they're they're a decent shout. They've got plenty of class. Um they were, you know, they beat Lockmore Castellani, who are obviously, you know, as seasoned as they come. Uh, and they pulled away from them an extra time. 
Um, and I, I think they have a decent shout in this. I, de- I don't, definitely don't think it's as simple as the easy narrative of a, a Kerry Cork final. I think if there's going to be an upset, it'll be it'll be Ennis to cause it this weekend. Well, there's seven or eight inter-county players between both codes and two or three more that were underage county players as well. Like hurl- like when you throw a hurler into a Gaelic football team at club level as well, if they're of that level, Davy, they can be extremely useful. Oh, absolutely. I think me and Michael's notes are very similar. Um, I think this is the game of the weekend for an upset, to be honest with you. I think this is uh, Air Ogre being hugely underestimated here. Um, considering the strength of Clare Club football, Kilmurray and Bricken are a serious, serious footballing team. And and I went back in anticipation of this. I went back and watched the 20-minute highlights of the county final. And they were never, ever in doubt. They were comfortable the whole way through. Barring one goal line save from the full back, they were very, very comfortable the whole way through. So, um, you know, even up oh, front and Cooney, their captain, he looks to be a right, right good footballer. Uh, I think David Reedy, the hurler, getting to your point, Shane, David Reedy is making a massive impact at centre forward for them. And just just to quickly go back to Chemeliers, a huge threat for them is Simon Donahue, the Wexford hurler. Mm-hmm. Really good wing back, and he's doing set up a goal the last day against Nave Martin. And uh, so the hurlers seem to be overlapping big time. It seems to be fitness levels, obviously, are excellent. And uh, they really are adding a different dimension to these football teams. But, uh, you know, you'd only love to have a few more of them in a few different teams, you know? Yeah, so there's obviously a conic final down the line and Ulster is still to be played out. Who would you see, Davy, as the, the front runners for the Club All-Ireland this year? I mean, the interesting point is so many players, or so many of the massive teams, you know, the Carfin, they're obviously not there. Um, St. Vincent's obviously were so strong for a while. It's There's there's not as many massive teams as there used to be. So it's, it's open this year. It, it is open, but population base, there still is Kilmacud Croaks, Nace. You're still talking of huge population bases and, and massive, massive towns or whatever you want to call them. But um, for me, if I if I was putting money down this weekend, Shane, I think the All-Ireland winner will come from Kilku and the Glen. Uh, that's, I would believe, so that's two powerhouses going at it. Now, I know Slot Neil have dominated up there, but now since Maliki's gone in, Malachi and Ryan Porter gone into the Glen uh, and Glass is back and McFall is playing the football at the level he is. Uh, I think the All-Ireland winners could come out of that game this weekend with Derry Gonley and Clan Aaron on the other side. And, you know, I, I do think they're, they're, uh, that's, you're looking at a potential All-Ireland winners to win that game Sunday evening, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, and just about- on that, Shane, if you do mm-hmm. find, like, Kilku are, like, 8-1 to one at the moment. I think the Glen are 7-2. to two. That's based on, like, there's a big discrepancy if, as I would, similar to Davy, if you're putting a lot of stock, I think for the weekend's game, Kilku are seven to four, uh, the others are eight to thirteen. Like so, seven, eight to one to win All Ireland for a team that's been there recently enough is well. It, listen, it could look like awful value on yeah, uh, on yeah. Sunday on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, but I think it's decent value at the moment. There's one thing I can guarantee you about Kilku is if you look at the Scotstone game, I was a little bit disappointed in them. Like McFall had the freedom of the park; he absolutely destroyed them. I can guarantee you Kilku will not do that. Mickey Moore and, and Conley Gilligan, and they're, they're, they're too seasoned. They're absolutely too seasoned for that. They, they'll, up, they'll shut McFall down or they'll go as close to shutting them down as they can and they'll have they'll have Brannigan in there uh, um, disrupting glass. And and for me, they're short of forward, uh, Glenn. That's what they look to me, the short of forward. Whereas you have the likes of all the Johnson brothers, you have the likes of Conor Laverty, you have the likes of Paul Devlin. For me, I think 7-4 and I think 8-1. Um, yeah, I might have to go somewhere this afternoon myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was going to ask you as well about I'm not sure how, how you're, if you've had any dealings with him but Maliki O'Rourke and you mentioned the loop already in 2003 taking them from nothing to or from nowhere I should say to being uh, Ulster champions how impressed are you by him and what he's done throughout his career yeah he's serious I, I, I've only ever had a social uh, meeting with Maliki and uh, he's a gentleman absolute real gent now a great hour long chat with him there one day it was a all and final actually but um, um yeah, he's very, very impressive. Even what he done with Monaghan, he, he did seem to get a huge improvement and a huge level of performance, consistency out of that Monaghan team as well. And it was an aging team. Now, the current Monaghan team obviously have, you know, uh, King David Ulster, Minor, and coming through the last couple of years, they're all coming through now. Mackie didn't have that at his disposal. He had a much, much more, you know, whatever older side at his disposal. And for me, he done unbelievably well with them. Uh, and he's been, has he managed for Mana as well, as far as I'm aware? Yeah. And uh, I, yeah, like, He'd be for me. He's probably their own manager in waiting. Really, is uh, is where I would think he'd he'd go after the two boys, you know. But uh, he's he's probably if you look at any job that comes up in the country, he's going to be in the top two in the betting for it because um, you know he's that good. He, he's 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 sought after all around the country, and uh, for me, he's probably one of the best ones out there. Yeah. Do you? It seems you mentioned Tyrone. Do you see Tyrone going pretty close to retaining All Ireland in twenty twenty two? 
they have to go to hard road. That's one thing for sure. Um, yeah. to, are they in the preliminary against Fermanagh? I think. Um, Ooh, I think they are. Yeah, I I'll think look they it up are. There. And that even could be that even could be early in the year. Is that late April or early May? Um, it's very very early. And for me, the key to that is Derry are waiting the winner. So Derry, Rory Gallagher and his team are sitting in the stand watching that game and picking you apart. And and you look at Derry Gonley, you look at these teams. You know the Fermanagh aren't that far away. You know they're not not a million miles away. So. Uh, I, and, and that Derry team for me is really, really coming. I think they'll comfortably get out of Division 2 and I think they'll be a Division 1 team next year and I think they're a threat to all in Ulster, definitely a threat to all in Ulster this year. So, no, I, I, well, sorry, of course Tyrone could go and retain their all and Absolutely, of course they would, but they've the huge long road ahead of them if they're going to do it and they're going to need luck. They have a huge amount of games. They're going to need luck with injuries. They're going to need a lot, like, you know. So, um, uh, I would possibly see Sam Maguire going elsewhere but of course they could retain it. The only reason I would say I think it'll change hands is uh, the road they have to travel. That's all, you know. Yeah, you were you were dead right on the draw there. I just double checked it. What about Mayo losing Oshin Mullen? And obviously they had huge disappointment in the All Ireland final, and I'm sure in many ways they feel they left it behind them. But do you think they're kind of getting to the stage again now, where even this new generation has now lost two All Ireland finals? The win, the losing feeling maybe you know it just becomes one of those things where you have white line fever in a big game and this keeps happening over and over but you know can they end this barren run do you think it's nearly like the opposite to tradition isn't it like it's the yeah. opposite the way that the tradition gets to you and then the way that losing all the time gets to you as mm. well um yeah look the losing Oshie Mullen to firstly a uh, huge what a player two years in a row did he win young player of the year like hugely important player and what a what an asset to any team but he's probably you know better than to lose Tommy Conroy or to lose Ryan O'Donoghue or to lose Killian O'Connor again or or whoever well, because of where Mayo are strength like they've huge strengths and bringing more lads through with the back line with Enda Heshey and Al McLaughlin etc etc all coming through like bombing wing backs and cornerbacks Mayo seem to produce in abundance from Lee Keegan and you know Keith Higgins etc etc all the way down Colin Boyles and now they're producing a new generation of them it's the out and out forwards and we would have found it when we played Mayo in the All Ireland final 2018 or 20 we went into that game and Tommy Conroy was there Ryan O'Donoghue were there you know Oshim was out injured that day, but they, they no marquee forward. We were fairly confident going into the game that our couple of a couple of decent shutdown markers would would look after what Mayo had, and it's just something they really do lack coming through. So I think losing Oshim, while it's a huge blow, it's definitely a better blow than losing either of the other boys in the forward line. To be honest, which I think. Um, and then yeah, now you've two senior All Ireland finals lost. One was probably a bit of a a bit hard to know with the Christmas one there with, with no one had it and it was a bit different it was a bit of a different environment I'm sure for the lads but this one again would have stung because beating Dublin in a semi-final is no good absolutely no good and celebrating and, and, and you know it's absolutely no good to anybody and not going on a back it up because you know you fell into the trap that the whole country looked fit to fall into you know and you can't you can't be doing that you know so uh, this one will hurt I think this one will hurt could set them back uh, I see James and his management are coming back again I think they have a long road ahead of them um, Killian is obviously a huge boost though Obviously, huge boost, Kim Cup returning, and, um, you know, he'll give him a huge boost. And, look, they'll be there, thereabouts there. They always are. And it'd be interesting to see how they go in Division 1. You know, this crack of being in Division 2, it's a different level of football. You know, the physical stakes, different level of football, you know. So, look, it'll be interesting to see how they go, you know. Yeah. Um, final topic, maybe. Um, Christy McCaig this week, he was talking about how change is desperately needed to reinvigorate the current championship structure, basically. What do you, what do you, you've been there with Wicklow and obviously Kildare are more that's heading towards the top end of things. But what do you want to see? Like, to be honest, uh, it was a proposal B or whatever. I was, I was behind that. Um, I was behind that. I, I, I do believe, um, I do believe the interest is waning a little bit around the country. Uh, the National League for me is our best competition and our primary competition. And for if you're in Division Three or Division Four, let's be honest about it, it's your absolute championship. It's your number one competition. You're going hell for letter from early doors to be ready for the 25th of January for your first round of the National League. And you'll take what comes in the summer and ultimately you'll end up with a drubbing off a bigger team, a Division One team in your in your province. And that's ultimately where you're going to be. And that's why you have problems with J1s. And that's why you have problems with lads not committing for two championship games, one championship game. And everyone knows you're going to get a hide once you draw the bigger team, the Division One team in the province. So I do think that um, that's a major issue and, and it has to be addressed. I'm not sure the Talton Cup is the, is the, is the answer either uh, in that it, look, it, it, it you know, it, it is, it is a, a solution provided it's marketed. So the likes of E-Boys need to give it a, the best chance you, you can because if it goes down the Christie Ring, if it goes down the uh, Nicky Rackard and all these other competitions, if it goes down that route, well, there's there's going to be some dropout rate because at the end of the day, lads want profile, they want status, they want to be seen, they want, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you like this. We, 
when Wicklow, we would have beaten Cavan in Division 3 playoff last year to stay in Division 3 and relegate the Ulster champions. And, uh, you know, Shawnee Furlong would have been playing, ah, oh, he's 13, 14 years playing. He would have got one four from play off uh, Faulkner, the current All-Star fullback. And let his young one, 13 or 14 years of age, mad for football, mad to see her dad. And he was certain she'd be on the Sunday game that evening. Uh, didn't even get a minute. Not even a minute, not even 20 seconds to get the Sunday game. And a huge achievement We in, in, in Wicklow's terms and our terms, absolutely retained Division 3 and relegated the Division, uh, sorry, the Ulster Champions. And look, that's the problem. You know, the media aren't interested in it because obviously they don't think it puts bums on seats. And um, what's going to happen with the Talton Cup, no matter what they tell you, no matter what they tell you, it'll die away. And then you're losing 16 teams, which isn't good for anybody. You know, that kind of way. So uh, for me, it comes down to marketing. It comes down to profile. Can we throw in an all-star award? Can we throw in a team holiday? Can, you know, surely the, 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 I think the wedge is there. Let's be honest. I don't think we're short on that front. So um, um, for me, that it comes down to all the above, Shane. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Dave, you've been absolutely brilliant with your time, and there's a few positive comments in saying people could listen to you all day. So appreciate having you on, and uh, enjoy the football at the weekend. Thanks very much, lads. Cheers. Cheers, Davy. So that was Davy Burke. There, great to have him on, and uh, what a preview he gave. As Joe Butler says here, what a knowledgeable and passionate guy Davy is. He would nearly make me interested in Gaelic football again with his passion and positivity. Obviously, a strong hurling man there, Joe Butler. Uh, normally in with the comments on the Kilkenny hurling, so. We can imagine you're not the biggest uh, hurling man or football man in the world. We'll just quickly go over a couple of the other games that we didn't touch on there. And there's some interesting ones in Munster. So one that stood out to me was um, Drummond Inch against Nagale. That's on in Temple Tui this weekend. So Drummond Inch will have the likes of Seamus Callan playing football. And then I think in the junior Tipperary football, you're going to have Austin Gleeson playing for Mount Zion against Mikey Breen of the Tipperary Hurlers, also Stephen O'Brien. Uh, of Ballina as well. So uh, it's kind of a great outlet too to see stars from one court going out and playing in the other. Yeah, and I'd say they're loving it too, to be honest with you, because it's a nice break from the norm. I always, well, I probably started playing football before I played hurling, but I always love going back, back playing football. Um, to be honest, to all those lads you just mentioned there, um, it's not their first code. So you're going to, there's a little less pressure off. Um, you're going to enjoy it a bit more. And uh, it's a nice little release. And it, it's a perfect probably time of the year as well. They're keeping fit. It's to be seriously fit to, play, fit to play football at any level, really. Um, so yeah, and it's good to see those big names. I wouldn't like I'd look Mikey Breen looks absolutely like he'd be nearly a prototype footballer you'd, you'd imagine with the size and athleticism he has and Ozzy's probably the same be interesting to see whether Ozzy tries any audacious little things like he try on a hurling field as well but um, well, apparently he scored an unbelievable point from the 21 in the county final meant to be on race. Yeah, it's funny that that um that Callan is obviously an out and out goal getter in hurling, and he's playing. I think you said a sweeper for the Drummond Inch footballer. So it's um I suppose no one knows better how to play sweeper than him in the sense that he's probably had plenty of them standing in front of him at different stages during his hurling career. But I'd say the lads will view it as a great outlet and um maybe a way to avoid doing a bit of county training for the first couple of weeks as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of other former county players playing for Mount Zion. I think Martin O'Neill is playing. Stephen Roach, who people might remember playing around the centre forward midfield at different times for Waterford. And the former county keeper, Ian O'Regan, he's playing at centre back. Uh, so Ballina, actually, they're quite good. I think they won an A county final at under 19 against uh, Clonmel Commercials. So it suggests that they've actually got good players arriving in the club there. So Ballina against Mount Zion, that's in Burris Ali Sunday at half one and nearly tempted to go down home for it only for there's a Leinster club final and as I said Drummond Incher against Nagel in the intermediate semi-final they're going to get uh, tough they're going to get tough, tough I'd say uh, Callum will be kept going all day I think uh, they might want to bring out some coffee from his heyday spot in uh, in Thurless to keep him pepped up throughout this game beautiful yeah, think, little seamless plug there by the way yeah not bad <laughs> uh, but like the county players that um, Miguel have they won the junior club all Ireland a couple of years ago and they beat Beaufort in the county final there but they have Stefan Kunbor who's only back from the AFL they have Dermot O'Connor county midfielder who's playing senior with St Brendan's board as was a Kunbor actually and I think Jack Barry missed the county final but it's you know assuming he's back too his younger brother is called into the the Kerry squad also. So like there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talent there. I think they're I think they're crazily short to win that game. And like at this stage, 
with the way uh, the way the grading goes and how many teams to have playing senior, like Nigel are probably like nearly heavy favourites to be winning the intermediate All Ireland at this stage. Yeah, they're probably like number nine in Kerry versus number seventeen in Tipperary, and obviously people think Kerry on a football pedestal up there, and Tipperary wouldn't be quite up there with them. But the uh, likes of Emmett Maloney, a lot will rest on his shoulders for Drummond Inch. Also in the other semi final in the Munster Intermediate, it's Newmarket of Cork against Carfin of Clare. And Carfin would be considered quite strong for the Intermediate uh, game. And Jamie Malone would be coming back to his best there. And the two Cahills who won Hearty with Flannins there in flying form. The Ulster Championship is also on this weekend. We've more or less covered it anyway. But just to clarify the, the fixtures there, Denley, Derry Gonnelly Harps are up against Clan Aaron. Uh, Derry, Clan Aaron are managed by Tommy Coleman. He's been co- coaching for nearly four decades at different levels. And in the other one, then, Wattie Graham's the Glen, or basically Glen, I believe, against Kilku. To many people, that's the de facto Ulster final, isn't it? Yeah, to, to, to Davy and a few others, I think it's nearly an All-Ireland final. And um, mm. I, I don't think that's, like, you, you wouldn't be running away with yourself too much to say that. It's a massive, it's a massive game. Um, I still think Kilku will just about get over the line uh, and have the, the know-how and the nous at that level. But yeah, it's, it's probably the game of the weekend, I'd say, all across across all codes. Yeah, yeah, that'll be an absolute cracker. We we uh, didn't get a chance to talk about the Ulster Hurlem final, so we might as well come back to that. Schlock Neil against Bally Cran, that's on on Sunday. Uh, both both have won it, uh, won the Ulster title on three occasions. Bally Cran winning in 74, 76 and 93. Now they have lost four finals since. Where Schlock Neil have won it three times, 2016, 17, and 19. So, in many ways, I suppose most people would be nearly thinking, ah, this will be Schlock Neil's. Uh, they would, uh, but obviously, Bally Cranmer, the last team to beat them, they beat them in that 2018. Uh, I think it was a provincial semi final at the time. Mm. It's just interesting to hear Christy McCaig talking about that this week. He just talking about uh, the current Schlock, Schlock Nail team, as Nisha says. And yeah. uh, and their rivalry with Bally Cran, he just said, this current team, we've been on the beaten track as a collective at least 10 years. The one thing we've learned more than anything else, with the greatest respect to everyone else's opinion, different narratives are created. We tend uh, we tend at this stage to ignore it. Because we've been in the arena and we have the experience, uh, we have done the preparation. And while there have been good days of shock nail, there have been some very hard, harsh days. 2018 was one of them. We were beaten comprehensively. Nothing went right. We will see on Sunday whether we've learned from it because it's the same opposition. I couldn't say that the defeat learned us more lessons than any other defeat. Every day is different, but clearly that would have that would have hurt a bit. Um, definitely would have hurt a bit. Um, Bally Cran have been waiting a while. Uh, they beat Portaferry in the the down final. Um, just you know, you're going back probably the guts of about two months now at this stage. Uh, Connor Woods would be one of their main players. He won. Uh, he won. Uh, Joe McDonough All Star this year, uh, usually full back for full back or centre back for down. Very very good player. Interesting. I think his dad Dermot was the team captain when they won their last Ulster in 1993, and they have uh, Michael Ennis the captain and Brett Nicholson who was I think suspended in the county final or sent off in the county final. They're both back available um, for this game, which is you know if you're going to take down Schlock Neil, you're going to need everybody available to you, but they're going to have to like the big one is stopping Brendan Rodgers um, because it was essentially his little tour de force in the middle of the second half that last day was the difference between between them and Dunlai where I think he hit one three over one four with, uh, mm. to no response. So um, yeah, they're going to have to mark him tightly but they're also going to have to be very tight on Shane McGuigan. Uh, Chrissy McCaig is usually out around, I think he's out around the middle of the field a lot of the time with the herders, you know, serious engine as well. So uh, like, it's only last weekend that they played a massive game against Dunloy that people were saying was the de facto kind of probably Ulster final. Uh, fairly attritional game, even though they won by seven. Um, Bally Cran have had a wait, but I think there's kind of a you can level those two off. Uh, in that Schlock Neil uh, were waiting a good while before they played that fixture, so they should get a decent bounce from that and come on for that. Um, but they also would take a little bit out of you too. But I think. I think it's hard get away from Schlock Neil here. It's hard get away from them. And we have them very high up in our power rankings and justifiably so. Um, and I think they'll get the job done. Yeah, so Michael Ennis was ent- interviewed after that county final. So as you mentioned, he got sent off. And in Portaferry, like for the last number of minutes, Ballycran were down to 13 men. And it was a case of Portaferry bringing them to extra time. And then when they were restored to 15, they ended up seeing it out. I suppose Ballyhale, you know, against St. Yeah. Ryan is some, something similar. 
But um, I think it was uh, Ennis was saying, and he was saying afterwards, he was being interviewed in the Irish News, and he goes, we have a lot of talented young lads. Those boys are all early 20s, and they really stepped up for us. Uh, Stuarty, who's referring to Stuart Martin, was outstanding, could have got the nod for Man of the Match as well. We brought new lads into the team, and they're all adding to it, all bringing something new. And one of the new lads, uh, Phelan Savage, knocked over nine frees, apparently brilliant. And he goes, oh, Phelan, what a talent, just incredible. His father's son, Gary's son, genius with the stick. He can do anything. If he puts his head down and keeps working, gets the physical training in, he has the makings of one of the best hurlers in Ulster, if he wants to be, which is uh, which is no small compliment. He also said hurling is still king in the arts, but we have Ben Arthur's playing for Bangor. He scored a hat-trick during the week there. James Clark is a fi fine soccer player too. And Stuart Martin is playing rugby with the, the Queen's First and was with the Ulster Academy there. So there's plenty going on there. And that, that should be an interesting final. Hopefully it's an absolute cracker. We also have to talk uh, quickly about the Ulster, or the 2020 delayed All-Ireland Club final. Because Sarsfield is against Galway, or of Galway, or against Owler Cabala. So in the semi-finals, uh, Sarsfield saw off drum an inch without too much bother, 11 points to four. And then Owler Cabala beat Schlocknail, who, had, who were going for a four in a row, I think, just last year. 215 to 111 there. Like Sarsfields are very impressive and I'd, I'd imagine they're favourites here. Yeah, I'd say they are favourites, yeah. Uh, all the McGraths, uh, Orla and Eve McGrath in particular, um, Siobhan as well. Like a county level, like you basically have three, you know, three players who are nearly always guaranteed starters for Galway. Um, bolster and your your club team, which is massive. Uh, the fact that they, I think that final against Loch Neal was played I think it was like the last game played in Crow Park uh, before COVID in 2020. They got over the line. It was I, I, They'd been kind of knocking on the door for a while. So to finally get over the line was huge for them. And I know from speaking to Arna McGrath, doing an interview there a few weeks ago, um, they were very, very keen to defend, defend their title. They're back in the final. They had a, a big win over a drum, as you say, last weekend in fairly horrendous conditions. But they're coming up against an Owler side who produced a big result against Stockney last weekend. Uh, Ursula Jacob is still going strong. He's she got a goal the last day. Una and Mary Lacey are there. Uh, Kira Story as well. So you'd probably think Sarsfields, but uh, I definitely wouldn't have put beyond the realms of possibility that, that Owlert would, would do a job on them as they did to Stock Neil last weekend. I think that game is live on RTE, I think, at the weekend as well. So getting uh, getting the profile that they deserves down in Nolan Park, I think. Um, one of the finest fields in the country, and I'm sure it'll still be in great nick even for the time of the year. So yeah, that's going to be an interesting final. Yeah, there's actually so many games on TV this weekend. There's, there's plenty to look forward to there. By the way, uh, please do subscribe to the channel, bottom right-hand corner there if you're watching on YouTube, but uh, click on all the social channels as well. Great to have that support there. The audio podcasts are available at patreon.com forward slash our game. Really would appreciate uh, anyone who wants to follow their fiber a month. And don't forget, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off. I mean, look at this sweet little Kildare number. If you've been a Kildare man watching Davy Burke chat for the last while, if you're uh, if you're a leash man watching Liam O'Neill, these jerseys are available at orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game 15% off. So it's pick the lock time. Nisha Waldron is not actually here. He's unavailable. He's on duty in a relationship term today, so he can't actually make it. But he did pre-record a little video. I'm sure he's going to hammer me for getting it wrong about, I went for Lockmore plus four last weekend. I know you found a bookie with Ballygunner minus three. It came out to achieve one. But I'm going to claim a bit of a mini victory here because I feel I was done by the referee and Lockmore might have even gone on to win that game, but certainly would have beaten the handicap. I admit they, would have, they lost by five, but they were put down to 13 men and a penalty taken away from them. No, they shouldn't have got the penalty in the first place, let's be honest. Typical hard luck story. At the end of the day, you put money down, you didn't double up, you didn't get the job done. All that matters is whether you have the readies back in your hand again and you don't have them. <laughs> no. Here, I'll play the video from Nisha and we'll be back with a couple of our picks for next week. How's everybody doing? It's Pick the Lock week seven and we are back. I'm Nisha Waldron and just to go back over last week, right, we had one of the all-time great weeks in Pick the Lock, right? But myself, Michael Verney and the viewers went with... Uh, Ballygunner minus three and we all know that came in like it or lump it lads it came in uh, and Shane poor old Shane went with Lockmore to cover that didn't happen as we know so that means that the standings sit at Shane at the bottom with two and four uh, the viewers are actually three and three I made a mistake last week the viewers are actually three and three now myself and Verney sitting on the top me and Big V um, are sitting at the top with four and two okay so we've been doing well a lot of the outside, all the outside bets that we talked about in the hurling especially came in. Nace, Slotnail, Banner. 
Lovely. Anyone to put them together, congratulations. You're far richer man than me because I didn't for whatever reason. And this week, right, um, this week in the hurling, look, we're going to go with, it's a huge weekend in hurling as well and in football too. Um, you know, the Leinster Club final, the Ulster Club final and the hurling. So looking forward to two of those games. Ballyhale Shamrocks minus six. Shamrocks haven't been good this season, especially since, you know, especially since the county final, right? They haven't covered the, uh, haven't been able to cover the spread for us, right? For any of the picks, right? And I, again, look, they're minus six against Balakala. I know it's in Crow Park, but uh, Shamrocks have, you know, suspensions and injuries maybe to worry about. Who's going to be ready? Did Balakala exert too much energy maybe against Crooks? That was a tough game, but they were very impressive against Crooks, right? So that six, you know, do you like it? Mm, I, I'm not 100% sure on it. I wouldn't be going near it uh, one way or the other. Because uh, again, Crow Park, too unpredictable. In Ulster, Bally Cran versus Slough Nail, right? Uh, Slough Nail were so good in the second half last week uh, in Armagh against Dunloy. Um, and this week looks to be a lot milder. The weather it could be drier, you know, more steadier underfoot. That gale force breeze won't be blown down into their face. So, you know, the way they set up between Karen the Cake, Shane McGuigan, Jared Bradley, Michal McGrath, and then the way they attack with, you know, Chrissy, Brendan Rogers, and Shane McGuigan, and, and Cormac as well. That last game will bring him on a lot. He was exceptional. Um, I just think they're really hard to score against and then really hard to stop from scoring. Uh, so, I mean, Cormac can score from anywhere when he's taking frees as well. Like, right? So, look, he's worth probably 10 or 11 points in a game, the way he strikes frees. So if the weather is nice like it is today as I'm recording, I could see them covering the seven. Again, that's no disrespect to Valley Cran. It's just that Slough Nail are that good, I'm afraid, right? Um, and then the football, look, uh, Crokes are minus three uh, against Port Arlington and Nace are minus five against Shell Milliers. Now, five is a big spread in football, I always think, right? You have to be really, really way better than the team, I always think, in football to beat them by six or seven points. So look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch either then, but again, get your comments in. What do you think? Agree with me? Disagree with me? Get your locks in. We want your picks. We want to put them up on the poll. So then the vote will be shut on Saturday afternoon and the viewers will be locked in. Just like you did last week with Bally Gunner. Good choice. So, then, this weekend in the NFL is a huge bumper weekend in the NFL, right? There's games on Thursday, there's games on Saturday, there's games on Sunday, and there's games on Monday. So there's a few things that stood out to me that I actually like the look of. I really like the look of, which is Patriots plus two and a half against the Colts. Uh... The Texans plus three and a half against the Jaguars. Not only do I kind of like those two teams to cover that, I actually like the two teams to maybe actually probably win those games, right? Uh, Bills minus ten and a half against the Jaguars. Look, we spoke about the ja or not, sorry, not against the Jaguars. The Panthers spoke about the Panthers last week. Look, they're they're, you know, I, I saw somebody said Cam Newton is throwing lawn darts, ten yard spikes. He can't throw the ball. He's not the same player he was. Christian McCaffrey's gone. They, they, I don't know how they're going to score really, right? Uh, Dolphins minus eight and a half against the Jets. And the Cowboys minus 10.5 against the Giants, right? Uh, Giants look quarterback, banged up, probably not going to be playing. Their season is pretty much over. You know, why risk it? You know, But we're going to risk it for the biscuit because that's what we do around here, okay? My lock of the week is coming to you from, you guessed it, it's Baltimore. It's the Green Bay Packers. Ma, Green Bay Packers minus 4.5 against the Baltimore Ravens because we're thinking the... Lamar Jackson will not be playing. The Packers are 11-2 and two against the spread this season. That is exceptional. So here we go, baby. Green and gold. Minus four and a half. Lock it in for me. So again, get your comments in. Get the poll up. And we'll see you next week. Let's look. Nisha, one of the all-time apes there. <laughs> Highly entertaining stuff there. He's a... Uh... Jeez, you, you've chose to mute yourself there, Michael Verney, so you're going to have to unmute yourself. No, I just said he's not well. Sure, he's not. <laughs> not one bit well, but I love it. We're going to risk it for the biscuit, he says. Yeah, big fan of that one now. Big fan <laughs> of that. Yeah, chuckling away a few times. Joe, as he was uh, as he was going through that there, I was looking at some of the different bets, and I was thinking, Bally Hale minus six against Clock Balakala. If Bally Hale had shown a bit more of the form and, you know, like, devastating performances that we've seen over the years I'd be jumping at that you know ordinarily I think you would jump at that but I just don't know if I if I trust it I think Nace minus five like Nisha said it's just that little bit too wide of a margin for uh for Gaelic football same with Schlock Neil minus seven I, I find that's just a little bit long as well but I like Kilmacud Croaks minus three against Port Arlington 
I don't think that's bad. I'm not necessarily locking it up just yet. But you know, another one I've looked at there, Man United are up against Brighton this weekend. Handicap draw of minus one, 23 to 10. So unless I'm mistaken, that means win by one goal and it comes in. Yeah, I'm not. I wouldn't. The soccer now, I, I, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't touch it with a badge, but I'm not even going to pretend that I have a clue. Uh, but Ballyhale have been up by nine points uh, in their last two games and have struggled in both of them thereafter. I would have been similar to you. Um, you know, if it was Ballyhale uh, of last year or two years ago, you'd probably be thinking, yeah, they could cover that spread. But they've been letting leads slip, which is a bit worrying. Um, Nace, is, that's a big that's a big spread in football, now, in fairness. It is a big spread. You could win, you know, comfortably enough, and it could just be four or five uh, in football. Um, so I'd, be, I'd kind of be... I would tread carefully maybe with those. Uh, just on a couple of other bets, even last week that came up that, that Nisha didn't say. Blazing Cal won at Cheltenham, as we predicted he might uh, last Saturday. I think he was in around even money. Uh, there's a couple of decent, um, there's some decent racing in Navin on Saturday. Uh, not sure what price he'd be, but American Mike, um, it would be, a, you know, would be a very, very good shout to win the last at Navin on Saturday. It's a list of bumper uh, for Gordon Elliott and Jamie Codd. He's already favourite, I think, for the champion bumper at Cheltenham. Uh, that will be one. As regards other other GA bets, um, I was looking. I I do I do like Ennis, uh, Aero Ennis against the Bars uh, in the football. The handicap is three. Uh, it's definitely something uh, plus three even money. Aero Ennis, something that that might tempt me. I don't think there'll be much. Uh, I don't think there'll be much in it. But it's funny. Some weeks there are an awful lot of bets where you see, oh, I could pick X, Y, and Z. And then other weeks, n- not so much. And I think this is one of the weeks where, it, you know, you, I only really have one or two things in my head that, that I'm considering. What about yourself? It still doesn't, there's a lot of them just don't jump out at me like maybe last week. Yeah, but you know what? One that's, that I'm just looking at now and I'm thinking, that's not bad. Newcastle West plus five against Austin Sachs. Because I just, don't, like you had said earlier, and, and maybe Davy had alluded to too when he said that Kieran Don, he m- mightn't get those huge personal tallies in games. Still, obviously, very important. But maybe that's going to be a lower scoring type of a game. Newcastle West, West the last day out, won their game against um, the Nair, who are obviously missing a few lads because of COVID, eight points to six. So I'm thinking maybe this could be a rear guard action from Newcastle West and they keep it within the five. Yeah, I'd be kind of, I mean, I, I would be of that opinion that they, they usually don't blitz teams. Um, I, I probably don't know enough about Newcastle West would be would be my only thing. Whereas I kind of feel like you know a bit more about about Air Og and I've seen a bit of the bars uh, at different stages. But um, I think there 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 are two games that are going to be pretty tight in Munster. I think Kilku and the Glen is really really interesting. You know, Kilku are seven to four. To, to win the game, they're six to four, draw no bet. Um, and like I do prefer, I do, I, I, I prefer Kilku over the Glen, I have to say. And I think if I was having an All Ireland bet, I'd be having it on Kilku. Now that could be dead in the water Sunday evening, but I think that six to four, uh, draw no bet is a decent shot on Kilku, I have to say. The Glen are a very, very good side, don't get me wrong, but they don't have the same pedigree. That Kilku have, and as as Davy said there, Mickey Moore and Connor Gilligan are seasoned hands. Ulster club football, they're seasoned hands at getting results at this level. Kilku were knocking on the door for a good while in Ulster. They eventually got over the line, got all the way to an All Ireland semi final, pushed Carriff in to extra time. Um, I think they might just have enough there, and I'm gonna lock in. I'm gonna lock in Kilku, draw no bet, six to four. Um, I think it's the game of the weekend and I'm, I'm happy to have an interest in it and even if it ends in a draw at full time uh, or sorry even if, if it, it's basically it's going to be whoever wins the game so there won't be any draw there won't be there's no middle ground there for me um, I, I, listen it's a little bit ropey because it's going to be such a tight game and you have two teams that are both fancy to win the All-Ireland but uh, I think Kilku will just about get through there. I think six to four is rewarding. It's not even money. You put on put on two, you get your handy little five or not back. Would you not just go uh, Kilku plus one? No, I'm going to go six to four for them to draw draw no bet, win win the game. Either uh, it could be after extra time or whatever, but to just qualify to qualify to get through Kilku. 
Fair enough. That's a decent one, to be fair to you. I just don't really like the minus three. On, I think the minus three on Crokes is pretty good. I'd like it to be, yeah, a little bit closer. I, I just like the margin with Newcastle West being plus five. I haven't seen enough of Ballycran to know if I truly think that they can get inside seven points against Schlock Neal. So I'm going to go and I'm going to lock this baby up on Newcastle West plus five against Austin Sachs, who I think will get, get through, but not by more than four. Uh, if I'm honest, I think your bet's dead in the water already. To be honest, to be honest with you, have you with some insider info? No, I just think I just think it is. No, I just think um, I just think the Kerry boys will get the job done by seven or eight in that game. But uh, I, I'm not saying that I'd go for the the mine. I just think no. I just I don't I don't see it. But well, listen, you would have locked it up if you were that confident. Of no, I'm, I'm not that five. confident, but I'm confident enough to slay your bet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. Okay, that's it. I'm hoping to improve my two and four asterisk record uh, for next week. It hasn't been going great, but uh, I'm looking to get back on top. Andrew Sullivan, who watches the show, is six and all. He sent me a gif of the Undertaker the other day because he's on that. He's on the Undertaker's unbeaten streak for WrestleMania at the moment I think he has something to do with the giant stairs at either plus 9.5 or minus 9.5 it was in the comments there minus 9.5 Miami against the Jets yeah so he's going for the old 7-0 and all, and uh, hopefully the viewers will get into uh, positive territory and get 4-3 four four over the weekend as well but uh, yeah I'd be I'd be nervous enough this weekend but I'll, I'll, I'm happy enough to lock up Kilku yeah ML89 says surely Schlocknail in Ulster Final has to be the lock but the thing is, you know, it has to be an odds that's, uh, you know, fairly close to evens. It can't be like uh, six and four. It has to be five and six. So there can only yeah. be one number in the difference between the two, which sounds a little funny. Maybe you can explain it better. <laughs> Emily Lady Knight also says, um, um, Michael Hopper McGrath did back-to-back -back club all Ireland with Sarsfield's hurling team, and now his four daughters could do the same with the Camogie. Surely not many back-to-back -back all Ireland father-daughter son combos out there. Definitely not. Not not that not that I'm aware of anyway. Um they won it in was it ninety three and ninety four that Sarsfield did it and Burr beat them in ninety eight. I could be wrong on the dates, but that that's fair going to be managing the side now, get them to All Ireland Glory in twenty twenty and uh it was 2019, 2020, and then they could win the 2021 this Sunday. Uh, that's fairly tight, uh, odds wise as well. I think Owler to five to six. I think Sarsfields are actually um underdogs in that game by the looks of things yeah outer are actually favorites at five to six um which is interesting which is obviously a lot of stock been put on beating beating stock at the weekend mm. i wonder is there anyone any other one example of a father son or father daughter out there with back-to-backs because i was looking at bally hale straight away and obviously they've won it in 19 and 20 now but that's the first time that they've retained it so nobody from there. So if anyone does have an answer to that, let us know and uh, we'll talk about it next week. Reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Get any of their great jerseys at their website and use the promo code Our Game, and you'll get 15% off. Uh, Joe Butler says the Shamrocks, but yeah, I don't think um, I don't think any of their parents would have won back-to-back -back because they won it in 81, 84, 90, 07, 2010, 15, 19, and 20. So, uh, uh, and also, please do subscribe to the channel. Bottom right-hand corner there. God, there's so many things to consider. You'd be, you'd be all over the place at times. The uh, patreon.com forward slash our game. That's where you get the audio podcast. And uh, I'd say that's the height of it, is it? Yeah, if Liam O'Neill was tired now after his hour, we're even more tired, I'd say. Going to pawn a nice bit of dinner now. Yeah, and down the hatch. Okay, thanks very much, folks. We'll see you again on Monday. Cheers, Shane.